I think we're going to go ahead and get started if people are transitioning into their seats and, and taking their time. Hopefully everybody enjoyed the lunch. They got the nutrition they needed. We've got a really exciting afternoon for you. Uh, and we're kicking it off with uh, young talent, uh, young chefs here uh, who we're thrilled to have join us at HHS to talk about the importance of nutrition and education. So. Uh, we're delighted to have Fresh Farms DC join us with students, and then we have some uh, members of Congress that'll be joining us here shortly for an interesting demonstration on how food is made. Uh, Fresh Farms DC, specifically the Food Prints Program, is a comprehensive food education curriculum in public elementary schools in DC designed to improve health and academic outcomes for children and families. I can say as the parent of two young kids in DC public schools who love the Food Prints Program, I have seen firsthand the impact this program has and can personally attest to how amazing all the recipes are. So we've made them at home. I'm so excited to welcome this group here. So I'll have uh, Jen and Mike, or excuse me, Jen and Beth uh, come up for the demonstration. Um, and I know we'll be joined shortly on stage uh, by members of Congress who may pitch in uh, and help out a little bit uh, with Representative McGovern, Representative Barbara Lee, and Representative Sherry Pingree. Thanks. All right, good afternoon, everyone. We, we are all so excited to be here. A lot of work has gone in, on the, especially on the part of these students to prepare to be here with you today, and we're just so happy to have been invited to participate. Um, my name is Jen Mampara. I'm the Director of Education at Fresh Farm. Um, we're a nonprofit based in DC that works to build a more resilient, sustainable, vibrant, equitable food system in the Mid-Atlantic region. We're here today to introduce you to our Food Prints program. And for most of our time with you, these wonderful students will be in charge. They have stories to share and some really fun things to teach. Food Prints brings experiential food education to students in 21 Washington, D.C. public schools by embedding food educators and running teaching kitchens and school gardens. This year, we're working with over 7,600 students with our approach and model that is thriving in diverse schools across Washington, D.C. Food Prints has truly become a national model right here in the nation's capital for the tremendous impact that sustained, joyful food education can have. In fact, this month, the Journal of Nutrition, Education, and Behavior published research which found that Food Prints alumni students, students who had completed the program five and up to 10 years ago, say now that Food Prints has left them with three important things. One, a deep appreciation for fresh food. Two, an openness to trying new foods and three, confidence to make informed food decisions. We believe that food education is a key component of a successful food as medicine program. And while right now we just work with elementary schools in DC, with funding and support, this model can work in schools all across the country. Before we hear from our students, let's all just take a minute to think back to each of your own elementary school experiences. What memories come to mind right away? Maybe it's playing with the giant parachute in PE. Maybe it's a special reading group you had with a beloved teacher or eating lunch in the cafeteria. But now, imagine if you also had memories of unearthing fresh carrots and sweet potatoes from the soil in your school garden and cooking them together with friends in your school's teaching kitchen or being taught and trusted to safely use real sharp knives and kitchen tools to peel and shred apples, beets, and carrots, and then making salad dressing from scratch to mix them independently. Most Americans don't have these experiences at school, but for food print students like Ryan, Maya, Brooke, and Finn, these experiential and delicious memories will likely be some of the first and most powerful to come to mind when they're adults. Now, these wonderful students from School Within School here on Capitol Hill would like to take the lead, along with Regina Green, one of our fabulous Food Prince teachers. Please welcome them. Does this need to be turned on? 
All right, good afternoon. Thanks, Jen. All right, so we have Finn here. Finn, what's on your table? So on our table, we have an assortment of different plant parts, including roots, stems, leaves, flowers, fruit, and seeds. Do you have a favorite? Carrots. They're just the best. All, I don't really think I need to explain, but I will. They're just very sweet, which you would not expect from something you pulled out of the ground. Like, this is the root, and it's sweet. How can you not love this? And they make an amazing addition to basically every meal you put them in. And they're also fun to prepare. Thanks, man. <laughs> All right, Miss Ryan, do you have something that's a favorite on this table? Uh, the butternut squash, because it's um, good to toast, and it's a really good thing you can eat. Do you have a favorite food prints memory you'd like to share with us today? Um, my favorite was when we made this pasta, and it was, like, uh, cheesy and creamy, and it could be really good to make at home. Mmm, that sounds delicious. Thank you for sharing, Ryan. You're I'm gonna come over here to you lovely ladies. All right. Brooke, tell me, what do you have today? Um, Maya? We have, we have dino kale, mm -hmm. also known as? <laughs> Tuscan kale. Tuscan kale. <laughs> and what are you making with this Tuscan kale today, ladies? We, we are making kale, kale salad. salad. Mm, how are you gonna make that kale salad? We, we can are. show you. Thank you. Demonstrate, please. Ooh. Can we show you? Would you like to come over and, and work with us? Yeah. Um, so first, we've got, three, we've got three stations here. So. so what would we do with this kale first? First, you would fold the sides and like this. Then you whip it a little bit, but not all the way off. Um, then you can grab the bottom of the stem and one. Two, three. Did you guys rip your kale too? I think the adults are having a little tough time. All right, ladies. Maybe we can show them one more time. Get another piece of kale. Can we give our guests a piece of kale as well? All right. All right. So, Brooke, tell us, how do we do it? So first, you want to take the bottom and kind of fold it back a little bit and kind of rip it, but not all the way. Then you get ready and you hold the bottom of the stem and you kind of just rip it off like this. And then you put it with the other kale that you ripped so it's easier for you to do the next step. You can stack the two kales on top of each other and place them like this. Then you take the kales and you roll them up. Once you have them rolled, you get the knife and you cut them into little teeny pieces. Can you show us that? Will you hold one of those in the air? Yeah. The scraps. They should look like this. Is there a special memory you have with kale in your food prints classes? Yeah. So, um, when I was younger, I don't know about you guys, but I didn't like kale. <laughs> At all. And so when I went to food prints and we made kale salad, and I was like, oh no, I'm never gonna like kale salad, it's got kale. <laughs> But when I tried it, I loved it. It was so delicious. And then I realized, hey, I don't have to like kale in all things, but I can still like kale in some things. Thank you for sharing. What about you? Um, just like Maya, I didn't like kale at all. I never really ate it before. Um, but Ms. Franderin pushed me to try it. At first, I was really scared, and I didn't want to try it. But then when she pushed me and gave me the confidence to try it, I fell in love with kale salad. Do you guys have a kale salad that maybe our guests could taste today? Yes. yes. 
So these lovely students have prepared a delicious Tuscan kale for you. We have forks here, guys. <laughs> we do have forks. <laughs> Will you also tell us what's the other salad on the table? Right here, right here we have ABC salad. And what's that? Um, the A stands for apples. apples. The B stands, B stands for, for beet, and the C, and the C stands, stands for, for carrots. carrots. Um, I think Finn wants to tell us about that ABC salad. Um, I had ABC salad once. The only reason I ate it was because there was carrots, and I did not <laughs> expect that I would like it. But I really did love it, and it really helped me try new things. That's what Food Prince does. It helps you learn um, to be more just curious and easygoing when it comes to food. Hey, Ryan, ask our guest how the salad is. How do you think the salad is? Delicious and healthy, <laughs> and I'm hungry. <laughs> All right, would you all like to pass out your ABC salad as well? Oh, wow. This is the best lunch we've ever had. <laughs> I'm sorry, say that again. Um, this might be the best lunch we've ever had in Congress. <laughs> all right, ladies and gentlemen, before we end this, I want to ask my friends up here, what's one thing each of you would like to share to these lovely people who've never had food prints? What would you like to share about food prints? Ryan, I'm going to start with you. <laughs> okay, I'll start with Maya. One thing I would really like to share about food prints is that it really inspires other people to like foods or try new foods just based on that they thought never, they never liked based on the shape or color of the vegetable. And then it also encourages um, students at the school to when they grow up, eat healthy and um, be able to make stuff from scratch when they get older. What about you, Brooke? What's one thing you would like to share with these folks about food prints? Um, for maybe about a year now, I've been cooking a lot of things, and one time I was making the spaghetti, and I noticed that we had some basil. So um, Ms. Finneran had taught us a lot about basils. We've planted a lot of food. We learned about little bugs and insects, and um, I decided to put a little bit of basil in it to give it like that little spice. And I learned that from Ms. Finneran, who is our food prints teacher at SWS. Thanks, Brooke. All right, Ryan, you ready? <laughs> Tell us one thing you want these folks to know about food prints. So at first, I didn't like tomatoes and like all that type of stuff. And then when I tried it, and then when it's mixed with other things like um, soups or when it's mixed in tacos, it could be really good. So I learned that from um, food prints because we've tried like a burrito kind of taco, and it was really good. So could really learn from food prints. Thanks. Thank you, Ryan. Chef Finn, who's still chopping kale. It must be one of your favorite things to do next to carrots, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, what do you want to share about food prints? So I wanted to share that um, food prints not only um, makes you a better chef, but it can also make you a better person because you have to collaborate with your classmates in some to make the best food you can. And it might be difficult, but it really helps you just um, expand your horizons in so many different ways, not just including f food. Food Prince is more than just a class. Thank you, guys, Ms. Mumpar. Um, thank you so much, all of you who helped to teach today, and also thank you to everybody who participated. Um, we see the same excitement that you see here today in our classrooms across DC every day. What if you had these kinds of joyous food experiences as a child? How might they guide the way you approach eating as an adult? Would these positive childhood memories affect how you would react to a prescription for fresh fruits and vegetables from your healthcare provider? Prescribing healthy food to manage chronic conditions is powerful but it only works if we eat the food. And food education is the solution. 
We've been doing this very successfully in DC for the last 15 years and have been tirelessly supported by two incredible champions, our DC city leaders and Chef Jose Andres, who, along with us, believe in this approach to empowering our future food citizens. Our dream, all of us here, is that in addition to PE, art, and music, every child has joyful food education in their schools. And children across the country join Ryan, Maya, Brooke, and Finn in growing up with the skills and desire to eat nutritious food. And we know it's probably your dream too. We invite you to join us. Come visit one of our classrooms. Reach out even if you can't visit and you still want to learn more. We want to work with you. I'm so inspired by the crowd here today, and I feel sure that together we can prescribe a better, healthier future for our country. Thank you. Can, can we get another round of applause for our young chefs? And I, I want to extend a, a huge thank you to Representative McGovern, Pingree, Lee, and Senator Marshall for being here today. We are so grateful for your leadership on nutrition and food as medicine and know you have been instrumental in helping advance the work we are discussing here today. So I'd like to invite each member up to, to provide some remarks. Uh, first, Representative McGovern. Well, thank you very much, uh, Rose, and I, I'm really impressed with these young chefs. Uh, I think every school in the country should be doing what they're doing, um, and we, get, we, we need to figure out a way to make that happen. Uh, but uh, I appreciate uh, the introduction, Rose, and I want to thank uh, Secretary Becerra and the Department of Health and Human Services for hosting this important summit. And I'm grateful to be here with my colleagues, Barbara and Shelley and, and Roger, all who have been uh, very much involved um, in the issues we're talking about today. Um, first, let me just say we would not be here today without President Biden and Vice President Harris. And I want to acknowledge my deep gratitude to this administration for their ongoing work to build a healthier, hunger-free America by 2030. And it's and um, it's also good to be here with so many familiar faces and drivers of change in the world of food, nutrition, and health. All of you who are on the front lines of implementing the recommendations of our new national strategy. You know, because what Hippocrates wrote 2,000 years ago is still true today. Let food be thy medicine, and medicine be thy food. You know, we know, we know it as individuals, uh, but we seem to have forgotten, forgotten it as a country. This isn't just about helping individual people. This is about improving outcomes and controlling health care costs and Medicare, Medicaid, and a whole host of other federal programs. We have a once-in-a-lifetime chance for change, to revolutionize our health care system in this country. And to put it bluntly, we need to do more. We are not moving fast enough. We need action when it comes to expanding access to medically tailored meals. The research tells us that uh, giving, ap that's an applause line, absolutely. <laughs> the research tells us that giving prescribers the ability to provide nutritionally balanced, dietitian approved meals could help prevent and even reverse chronic illnesses. It lowers hospital readmittances. I have a bipartisan bicameral bill to establish a demonstration program to include medically tailored meals in traditional Medicare. The president, president's budget includes it. So does the national strategy. But to those who say this can't happen without legislation, let me just say I believe it can. We need to get, a, we need to get creative and we need to find a way to make this happen. And it needs to happen now so we can start saving money and saving lives. However it happens, just get it done. To my friends in the health insurance industry, I know that my colleagues and I can be pretty harsh on you. My mom used to call that tough love. 
Uh, but here is my ask. Expand your coverage of medically tailored meals. You will, you will be on the cutting edge of transforming our health care system, and you will save yourselves money. To my friends on the provider side, please, please, please make the food in your hospitals healthier and more appealing. There are incredible models that you can follow all across this country that will save you money and make your patients happier. Work with local farms and invest in what you need to make healthy foods. Sponsor freight farms and community gardens at schools to help expand access to nutritious food. And teach kids and adults alike how to grow and to prepare healthy food. Think outside the box. I mean, I took algebra in school. I don't know how it helped me, uh, but I, I, I say that with all due respect to the mathematicians in the, in the audience here. But boy, it would have been better to learn about nutrition and learn how to prepare a meal. Uh, that's a skill that will last you a lifetime. To my friends in the food services industry, expand your offering of locally grown and nutritious food. And finally, to my friends in, med in the medical education world, please, pl I'm begging you, please make nutrition a bigger part of your curricula. There is, uh, there is huge support for this in Congress, a bipartisan push to get this on the boards. We passed my resolution last year calling for physicians to get more nutrition education. And I know there is slow progress, but don't wait for us to force it. We can get this done this year. Let us do it. And so I'm, I'm glad that this summit is happening. Again, thank you to Secretary Becerra and HHS for heading down this road. It is the right road. The momentum is behind us. The White House is with us. Let's, let's push harder and work more to get this done. Let's work together to feed and nourish and heal this country. We all should be impatient. Time is running out. We have a window of opportunity to achieve great things. Let's not blow it. So together we can get this done. And again, thank you all for all of your support and for being here today. Uh, and it's a great inspiration, again, to see these young people up here who should be our, our model. Um, and we should be inspired to do even more and work harder. So we will be wind at your back. Thank you very much. Thank you, Representative McGovern. Uh, Representative Lee. Thank you so much. So good to be here. Good to see everyone. Let me take a moment to thank um, Secretary Becerra and his tremendous leadership, his team, and also the Biden-Harris administration for really um, being visionary and understanding why uh, food as medicine is such uh, an important uh, policy decision that has to be made and has been made, actually. And thank you to all my colleagues. Uh, very few members of Congress, Senate, and House side are looking at this as deeply as these colleagues are and fighting so much to make sure that this becomes the uh, policy that uh, permeates all of our, our food industry, all of our systems of, of feeding and healthy foods in every single program institution in this country. A couple of, uh, first, let me just start with a personal story. All of us fight against uh, cutting SNAP benefits. And so several of us, I think, Jim, you were one of those who took the food stamp challenge several years ago. And we lived off of, for a week, I believe it was $4.70 a day, a little less than $5 a day. And the only way we could survive was by buying processed foods. And when you looked at the caloric content and the sodium content, my gosh, I could not believe it. For seven days, I ate, as unfortunately so many low-income people uh, are, who have to rely on canned foods and processed foods eat, uh, the sodium levels, the, the cholesterol levels, the um, caloric levels, off the scale. And that's when I said, wait just a minute. Uh, something has got to give because now it's very clear to me why so many people um, have, uh, so many children have uh, diabetes, and so many people of color uh, and low-income people have heart disease. And it was very clear then, and that's when I started looking at food as medicine. And so I'll just thank you for this inaugural Food as Medicine Summit. 
And um, I'm excited to join these ongoing discussions. And I want to thank our young chef. I just was thinking, and the children shall lead. I finally learned how to uh, get the leaf off of a kale stem <laughs> and finally learned how to roll it and, and cut it. I never knew that before. And I've tried to figure that out. So I want to thank them very much for teaching us so much today. And I am very proud that my district um, is leading the way on a food as medicine initiative and uplifting the legacy of a former supervisor who passed away was hit by an automobile, Supervisor Wilma Chan, who advocated tirelessly for this program. Because of her advocacy, the Recipe for Health program was created in 2019 to provide medically supportive food to low-income residents experiencing food insecurity and are diagnosed with or at risk of developing chronic health conditions such as diabetes, depression, heart disease, and so forth. And I'd like to thank also Dr. Stephen Chen and Ellen Ying from Alameda County. I don't know if they're here, but I want to thank them. Are you guys here for their efforts uh, in leading Recipe for Health and showing the nation that food is medicine is really here to stay and to grow. Good nutritious foods are the cornerstone of good health. Yet far too many Americans, especially in low-income communities and communities of color, lack, lack access to affordable nutritious food. As a result, our healthcare system spends nearly $1.1 to manage and provide treatment for diet-related diseases, equal to all of the money we currently spend on the food itself. That's unacceptable. We must do better as a nation in ensuring that we address these high levels of food and nutrition insecurity and chronic health initiative conditions. Excuse me. The good news is that there is a path forward to save lives and reverse disease, and that's why enabling health centers and healthcare teams to prescribe food rather than drugs for treating, preventing, and reversing certain chronic diseases. That's why last year, or year before last, I believe, I hosted a roundtable discussion with our Secretary Becerra on ways that food can serve as medicine in Alameda, California, Alameda County, California, and find ways we can scale up food as medicine nationally. Following this roundtable, I was very proud to secure, and let me tell you, this was uh, a heavy lift, but we did this in a bipartisan fashion. So we secured two million in the fiscal 23 federal appropriations bill. Not enough, that's just a drop in the bucket, but we will do more. But what this two million did was to begin food as medicine as a federal strategy. And I'm really excited to see HHS is using this funding to expand the vision of what is possible, using nutritious foods to improve health and racial equity in the United States. And so often, those of us who are fighting for appropriations and new policies, we never see the implementation of what we do. And so I just want to congratulate everyone for following up and making this a priority. Because we know that with health interventions such as biomedical treatment and prescription drugs, these are not alone enough. However, combined with the National Food as Medicine program, our healthcare system will have a more holistic capacity to truly reduce health care costs, improve health outcomes, and improve the quality of life for generations to come, especially for people with chronic diseases. We have a 2030 deadline, 2030, right around the corner. But we'll meet that deadline because of you to end hunger and to begin to transform our disease system to a true health care system through food as medicine. And I'm a proud member of Shelley, um, <coughs> excuse me, the Food as Medicine Caucus, and that really has driven a lot of what we're doing here today. So I look forward to working with all of you to turn our plans today into action. Let us recommit ourselves to making sure that Washington and, yes, our state partners don't get distracted. <laughs> Let's make sure that we stay laser focused on encouraging all states to cover food as medicine programs and to allow health care teams to prescribe, and this is so important, which what uh, Jim was talking about, to prescribe food-based nutrition interventions to treat and to prevent disease. That's what this is all about. So thank you all again so much for being here and for your leadership.
Thank you, Representative Lee. Representative Pingree. Thank you so much. And um, I, I don't know that the kids or the teachers are here anymore, but thank you for including us in that wonderful uh, little meal that we had. Uh, truly, as I said, one of the best meals we've had since we've been in Congress. Uh, made it the hands of these wonderful kids. And I, I've done a lot of work in my own district on school gardens and school kitchens and, and some of the wonderful teaching programs that there are in school. Um, for kids to learn more about cooking. So I'm a wholehearted supporter, and one of my favorite things is when you hear from a parent who says, you know, my kid wouldn't eat any vegetables, but they came home from school and said, now you gotta buy Brussels sprouts, now we gotta try kale, because they made it at school, or they grew it in a school garden, and so to them, it is a, takes on a whole new dimension. Really pleased to be here with you today. Very grateful to Secretary Bracera for bringing us all together and to the White House for making this a priority. I know Jim worked so hard on getting that health and hunger and nutrition conference together last year. It was really a, a, a landmark in time and an important moment, but to have it followed up this year by really digging in on food as medicine uh, warms my heart. It makes me so happy to be able to be here with all of you. It was 2018 that we formed the Food as Medicine Caucus. It was uh, Jim McGovern. Senator Marshall and myself. And um, to think about it, it's five years later and often you form these caucuses and it's hard to find uh, people to champion the ideas that you have. But it was really one of the beginnings of Congress forming a caucus to say, you know, hunger and food is much more about filling someone's belly. It's not about empty calories. It's about making sure people get the healthy nutrition and food that they need. So I'm thrilled to be here with uh, you guys. Uh, Senator Marshall, we're so glad that we now have an advocate in the Senate, so thank you. And to be here with Barbara Lee, who's been working on these issues, and her firsthand example of what they've done in Alameda County uh, should be very, very proud of that and gives us a great example of moving forward. My background is, uh, all about food and nutrition. I, I've been an organic farmer since the 1970s. That was a long time ago for those of you who weren't there then. Um, but uh, we thought we were moving forward on a sustainable food movement and some of the you know pioneering days of eating healthier food, eating more sustainably. Uh, and that's been a big part of my life, being an organic farmer on and off, owning a small restaurant. We have a, a farm to table kind of restaurant where people can actually come and see the food being grown and then go sit down and eat it. And I think making that connection, eating food locally, supporting local farmers, uh, really makes a huge difference in having people understand better about the food that they eat. I've tried to keep my focus in Congress on uh, finding any way we possibly can to work on these issues. Some of that has been through the Farm Bill, uh, working on the Produce Prescription Program, which uh, I know some of you have helped us to implement. Um, from the 2018 Farm Bill, and we were able to collect so much good data on that, seeing how it really changes things. I'm on the Appropriations Committee, and as uh, Barbara Lee, who serves there as well, talked about, we're always looking for those places where we can make a, a little bit of a difference on this issue, and now we're seeing it come to fruition. Of course, on agropropes, our big jobs are supporting SNAP and WIC and GUSNIP program, and GUSNIP in particular has really been so important at changing the dialogue around making it possible and affordable for people to get healthy food, but we've moved two million into the VA, and I know um, the Rockefeller Foundation is now working with the VA to implement that program, but it just creates us such huge opportunities with a big population that we could make a huge difference in the medical outcomes and the quality of life when, when people come home and, and need to make sure that they get the healthy food. And in the BAA, $3 million. And uh, again, these are paltry sums of money. We, we know we have to work harder to get much more. Um, but it's really profound to be able to work with that funding in the BIA. I wasn't able to listen to the chef th speak this morning, but I know he talked a lot about um, this huge challenge. Uh, you know, we, we in Congress and many of us were responsible in historic times um, at removing traditional food sources from our native communities. Um, and they have some of the worst health outcomes, some of the biggest challenges around um, shortage of short life expectancy and dealing with some of the huge health issues that we're talking about today. So to have these five projects now going out there to make sure uh, that we're now funding better food. Um, I know Director Sow was on one of the earlier panels and hearing her talk about uh, what an important difference it is to bring those traditional values and traditional cultural values into the food um, that should be available to everyone who lives in a native community. So I'm really excited to see some of those programs move forward, but more importantly, just the overall change of thinking at HHS, the opportunity to have 1115 waivers in our home states, uh, to see the collaboration going on with so many of you in the private sector and 
um, the insurance industry, foundations that are working on this. Uh, you know, it's it's hard for Congress to make change. It's a uh, it's a complicated issue for us. On the one hand, uh, we we all eat. We, we all hear from our own physicians who say maybe a little less salt, maybe change your diet, uh, get a little more exercise. Uh, we know firsthand that we're supposed to eat healthier foods, um, yet we're also uh, given complicated messages, sometimes truth, sometimes not truth, lobbied by an industry, food, food processing, agriculture industry is enormous and has all their own interests about what we should be doing. So um, the work you do is incredibly important because the more examples that we have, the more pilot programs that move forward, the more ways we can say, uh, look at the cost savings, look at the improvement in the quality of life when we really make sure people have opportunities to eat healthy foods, whether it's our young people, uh, families, people coming out of uh, the hospital, uh, all these opportunities. Uh, I just want to say one more thing that I've been thinking about a lot, and I heard um, Commissioner Califf from the FDA talk about this briefly today. Um, you know, we, we have a lot of uh, new territory to move into. I mean, we're, we're just trying to make sure people can buy affordable, healthy food uh, and get it into their diet. But uh, he mentioned ultra-processed foods and the things that we're not even thinking about how we're going to regulate, how the impact that they're having on our, our diets today. And with this um, sort of revolution with the GLP-1 drugs, you know, we're all so excited that there might be ways to treat diabetes and obesity that really can change people's quality of life. But you write as, you know, you see a story about that every week and alongside every story is a uh, 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 an analysis of what this is going to cost our health care system moving forward to make sure these drugs are accessible to everybody. Um, you know, it'll be a huge boom for the pharmaceutical industry, but it'll also be a huge cost to many of the programs we care so deeply about, Medicare, Medicaid. And I can't help but think about uh, this dichotomy where we have this uh, growing availability of ultra-processed food and empty calories and people can't afford to get the healthy food that they need. And then these drugs that are going to take care of you and uh, it'll just be a panacea and we'll make sure it's affordable for everybody. Uh, wouldn't it just be a lot easier just to make sure everybody had access to healthy, delicious food? Okay, that's all I needed. That's my applause line, and uh, thank you. I, I look forward to working with all of you on that, and I, I think we know what our mission is. Uh, Jim is right. The time is right. We've got you know, uh, the support in the White House. We've got the support at the agencies. We can move forward on these things. And I will just say, uh, these are not really partisan issues. Not only will we hear from Senator Marshall, but, but I know from talking to people in my district, you know, this is the kind of issue when you bring it up and you say the term fruit is medicine. They say, oh, I've been wishing somebody would say that. You know, Why don't we do more about wellness and healthy food? It is an issue that everybody understands, and we just need to change the policy to go along with it. So look forward to working with all of you on that. Thanks so much. Thank you, Representative Pingree. Uh, Senator Marshall. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Food is medicine. Food is medicine. How about food is health? Think about that. How about food is health? I want to start by thanking and telling everybody in the room I'm grateful for your dedication and your commitment to this effort. If I could say one thing, I, I think we know the science and the, and the challenge is how do we implement this science and the folks in this room are going to help us get this done. I too want to thank my colleagues who are up here as, as well who helped us found uh, this caucus, this Food as Medicine caucus, Congress members McGovern, uh, Pingree, Barbara Lee, and I also want to mention the late Jackie Warlurski for her help with this as, as well. Uh, many of you may know I'm a physician. I practiced obstetrics for 25 years. For over 25 years of my life, I delivered a baby most every day and had the call to come to Congress. My wife is still upset about that, but here we are. You know, and very few days go by that someone doesn't ask me, how, how can we save Medicare? How can we fix Medicaid? How can we drive the cost of health care down for people? And they look at us like we've got a magic sword up here to fix the problem. And though I think there's opportunities for more transparency, for more innovation, to make patients consumers again, I think that this role in nutrition could have a larger impact than any of those. And I'm proud to share some of the work that I've been doing since we joined the Senate three years ago. 
certainly one of my best colleagues over there to work with this has been Bernie Sanders. And you might wonder, how does a conservative from Kansas and an independent from Vermont get, a, you know, get along? But Bernie and I share so many of the same goals. We both believe that prescription drugs are too expensive and people don't have access to primary health care. And certainly that nutrition is a key component. What we've learned, well, as we've shared notes back and forth, we both concluded that community health centers are a clearing place where people meet the needs of the patient right there. So he and I have fought for more funding for the community health centers to make sure that they have a nutritionist there. And it doesn't have to be a PhD nutritionist. I got to tell you, I had a diabetic uh, OB clinic uh, every, you know, all, every year in my practice. The nurses are great teachers. We need a quarterback. We need a coach designing those programs, but making sure that each health center has nutritionist nurse, nurses focused on that education part. Um, we think it's a place where we can get the food banks in. And, and bring in that, those expensive you know, foods, those fresh fruits and vegetables, all the fresh foods in as well. Um, I think it's a place where it can be cooking classes. Let me you know, just share another real life story. My wife volunteered at food banks every Tuesday afternoon for goodness, some 20 years. And uh, one, one week we got our credit card bill and she had purchased, she had purchased five crock pots. I said, dear, we've got a crock pot. The church has a crock pot. Why do we need five crock pots? And she said, well, we got some fresh roast uh, at, the, at the food center. And we had patients coming by, and we tried to give it to them, but they didn't know how to cook it or what to cook it in. So she went and got crock pots and taught them a little quick class on, on how to you know, make a simple meal, a nutritious meal, before someone left to work. It's something as simple as a crock pot as well. So we think that that's a place where that teaching and coaching, you know, a lot of this is just coaching people up, can happen. I've been proud to work with Senator Ed Markey on treating, coming up with a nutrition plan for chronic diseases, for, you know, let's say the, the 20 most common uh, chronic diseases we have. What's a specific nationwide nutrition plan? I, I think we know what a diabetic diet looks like, but let's, let's focus in. What about a person that has cancer? What about a person that's at, at risk for breast cancer or uterine cancer? I mean, most people don't understand that uh, fat cells can turn cholesterol into estrogen, and that leads to increased risk of uterine cancer and breast cancer. So we need to make sure that I'm asking uh, HHS to be working on a program that we have a nutrition plan for all those major disease classifications as well. Uh, next, uh, I, I think Jim mentioned this, this pilot program. Senator Stab and I are, are, are leading this for a, a, move, a food plan when people go home they've been hospitalized. That we've, that we've seen studies already that when a Medicare age patient goes home, something as simple as giving them a meal a day, much like a Meals on Wheels program, that it decreases readmission rates maybe 30 or 50 percent. But unfortunately, the way we look at it up here in Congress is it's going to cost us you know, 30 mils times $10, $300. So, so folks up here score that as a cost. I'm sitting here saying, but you're going to save a $35,000 admission. So we have to re-educate folks how we, we score things like that up here. Corey Booker and I are, are working on something, a uh, nutrition program for teens at risk for type 2 diabetes. And, and then lastly, I want to talk about, wait a second, hold on here. I'm sure you all know that only two drinks are allowed on the Senate floor, and that would be water and milk. And milk is the most wholesome, greatest nutrition drink known to humankind yet. So I'm pr proud to work with Senator Peter Welch from Vermont on getting whole milk back into schools. Folks, we're going to see an epidemic of osteopenia and osteoporosis in this country because a generation of children and now young adults don't drink any milk. Uh, it's so simple to communicate this that women reach their peak uh, uh, bone density around age 27. And then it slowly goes down. So now our 27 year olds are gonna be reach this type of a peak and slowly go down. So they're gonna get osteoporosis, osteopenia 10 years earlier. We're gonna start seeing men now with osteopenia and osteoporosis as well. I understand we have to count calories, but a little common sense goes a long way. The kids aren't gonna eat, are not gonna drink skimmed milk and low fat milk. It doesn't taste worth a darn. 
<clears throat> on the other hand, whole milk allows you to absorb your fat-soluble vitamins A, D, and, and K as well. Uh, it's a nutritious drink. And again, just getting those kids back in the habit of drinking milk rather than some of the alternatives out there is a great thing. So those are just some of the examples of, of what I'm working on. And again, I think most importantly, you know, my encouragement is how do we take all these ideas and concepts and turn them into, you know, in, get them to work. And that's where we need folks like you out here coaching and teaching people up as best we can. So thank you so much. Food is health. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I want to thank all of our members and Senator Marshall today for uh, their commitment and dedication to this issue. We are grateful and thrilled to work together to advance changes in the food as medicine landscape. We're now going to transition to the second part of our day where we're going to focus on collaborative approaches to advance food as medicine. To frame this portion of the conversation and set the stage for the remainder of the afternoon, I'm delighted to welcome to the stage and share their views on considerations for food as medicine and implications for the future. Hilary Seligman, Professor, University of California at San Francisco, and Dari Mozafarian, Director of the Food as Medicine Institute at Tufts University. Thanks so much. Thank you. I'm really excited to be here and excited to follow that inspiring panel. Dari and I thought that we might start out by grounding this in a little bit of clinical experience and a patient story that has motivated us to be researchers in this uh, field for the last 20 some odd years. And the story I'll, I'll choose for you um, was a patient I saw about 20 years ago who uh, I was sharing a new diagnosis of prediabetes with. And as I asked him what he ate, he told me that every day for lunch, he ate a piece of Spam between two cinnamon rolls. Every day. And that stopped me cold. I'd been a provider in the safety net as a general internist for many years, had never heard anything like that. But it turns out that he had 50 cents per day to spend on food after he paid his rent. And he knew that if he ate a piece of Spam between two cinnamon rolls, it would keep him full until the next day when he could eat again. And I, as a provider, sat there and thought to myself, I have two choices here. I can put him on a drug, and it will be free for him. Or I can do an equally effective thing, which is to ask him to eat healthier food but I'm gonna have a budget of 50 cents per day to do that. And I can't help him get a healthy diet for 50 cents a day. And I, as a physician, don't have any tools to help him get to a healthier diet. So my only choice was the medication. And I think what drives this conversation today for me is how do we resolve that conflict? How do we create a system and a structure in the US where medication is not the only option for treating the obesity, the epidemics of diabetes and cardiovascular disease and some cancers that we're seeing? So Dari? Uh, yeah, thank you, Hillary. Uh, so again, we thought you know one of the voices missing from the conference is of people with lived experience and uh, in with with these diseases. Although many of us have or will have these these diseases soon, uh, I want to tell a more recent story of a of a woman in Iowa who uh, had type two diabetes, single mother, um, fairly young in in her forties, was diagnosed with very severe type two diabetes. Already had evidence of end organ complications. Her doctors told her she was likely to go blind likely to, to ultimately uh, go on dialysis. I was already having neuropathy and may need to, to uh, ultimately have an amputation. And fortunately, there happened to be a demonstration program, a food as medicine demonstration program uh, of produce prescriptions. And so she went on the program, and after six months, her hemoglobin A1C was dramatically uh, improved. She was on many fewer medicines. Uh, all of her uh, 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 numbers and everything in her labs looked, looked much better. Her doctor was shocked, she was shocked, and she said, you know, the doctors told me I have this disease. I thought I was gonna have it for the rest of my life. I now know through healthy eating, I might be able to, to cure myself. But the really important part of her story was none of that. The really important part of her story was she said, what's really been meaningful to me is how this has changed my relationship with my son and in our family. Because she said, well, I would pick up my nine-year-old from school every day. I wanted to give him a treat. She, she was, you know, low, 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 low income mother. He, what do you want to do? I'm hungry. He wanted to go to McDonald's. I'd go get a McDonald's. We'd, we'd, we'd have it, and then, and then we'd go home, and I'd make dinner for myself later. Now when I pick him up, because we have this produce prescription voucher, he says, I want to go to the grocery store. And they go shopping together, and they pick out fruits and vegetables together. They go home, and they, sit, they go in the kitchen, and they cook together. 
and they sat down and they ate meals together, which she said hadn't happened in, in, in over a year that they were actually eating. And she said it has completely changed their relationship with her son, completely changed his relationship with her and their ability to sit around. And so food is really nourishment, right, uh, uh, around so many other things beyond, beyond our health. And we forget that. And we forget that most Americans do not eat healthy food, do not prepare healthy food. The vast majority of Americans don't. Um, and, and this is the challenge of our system, and that, and that the approach of food as medicine from the population level uh, all the way up to the clinical level can start to address. OK, so we're, we're two data researcher geeks. So those are your stories. Now we're moving on to the evidence. Dari, I'm going to start by asking you a question, which is, can you summarize where we are as a food as medicine field in terms of the data and the evidence? Yeah, so you know, food as medicine is not a, obviously a new concept, um, but we really need to have strong science. And I think um, Commissioner Califf said it earlier, you know, we need to have sort of regulatory grade science or clinical grade science if we really want to make some big decisions and shift you know, billions of dollars in, in healthcare spending and, and, and other spending. And so there's a lot of foundation of strong science here, and there's a lot left to learn. First, there's, there's founded on the science of nutrition being good for health. Um, there are multiple large long-term randomized clinical trials of nutritious food-based dietary patterns showing reductions in hard clinical endpoints. Uh, there's uh, the uh, PREDIMED trial. There's the CORDIOPREV trial, both of which were very large food-based uh, trials lasting many years, showing that heart attacks and strokes and diabetes were significantly reduced with healthy diets. There was the original diabetes prevention program, right, which showed that a healthy lifestyle, including a good diet and physical activity, beat metformin, which was is, is still the foundational first drug for, for treating diabetes. So there are plenty of randomized controlled trials showing that good nutrition works and improves uh, health outcomes. We know that to be true. There's also randomized controlled trials, less people may, may know about this, showing that behavioral counseling by a professional works, uh, an RDN. We haven't mentioned RDNs. They're incredibly important, right, for, for behavioral counseling. <laughs> there, are, there are many, many randomized control trials, over 30, 40 randomized control trials, showing that RDN counseling, behavioral counseling, works and can change behavior. Of course, there are challenges. There's barriers or structural impediments to, to implementing those, those, uh, those re recommended behaviors. But still, uh, hemoglobin A1C improves, blood pressure improves, cholesterol levels improve when you have behavioral counseling. And so we know nutrition works, we know behavioral counseling works. What we've also learned or, or relearned is that those two are not enough. And so the power of food as medicine is to combine the science around good nutrition, the science around behavioral counseling, with actually providing the food. Providing the food in the right dose, in the right duration, for the right time period, for the right uh, 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 patients, uh, and having supportive community uh, and population level, level policies. So I think that's what we're trying to figure out. Not whether food as medicine will work, it will work. We know it works. We have randomized trials that, that show it works. Not whether behavioral counseling works. We know it works. How do we put it all together in an efficient way uh, and, and, and show that it works? And so I think that's really where, where we are. And you know, Hillary, um, you, know, you, you um, I think, will, will have, have thought about this and, and talked about this as well. You know, we can't have po every possible study looking at every possible outcome. Right? We have to sort of look at the big picture uh, and understand what works. And so I think there are some key questions about the patient population and the type of of intervention, but I think we're at the, at the cusp over the next few years of really understanding who food as medicine works and in what context. Great. And, and so thinking about uh, you know implementation, right? What are some of the trade-offs and challenges uh, in, in implementation that we have to think about? Yeah, I, I want to start just by elevating a point that you just made, which is that we don't have to reprove that fruits and vegetables are good for you, that healthy food is good for you. What we really, the moment we're at right now is understanding how do we get the best intervention, the best product to the right person at the right time, time in their life, uh, and also um, time you know, that they can take advantage of it, um, for a cost that we can sustain. That's really the question that we need more data to help us understand. What is that core service that counts as a food as medicine intervention that we know is supportive enough of a broad enough group of people uh, that it will have a real impact on health outcomes? What we're doing a lot of right now is local implementation of phenomenal food as medicine programs, but I think sometimes pushed by funders and um, pushed by a desire to contribute to a really incredible movement, 
All of those little programs are seeking to prove that they improve health outcomes, they save costs, and they are going to generate a return on investment. And they're going to do that many times with a very low amount of funding reaching a very small amount of people. We just can't do that. We can't prove a return on investment when we have 20 patients enrolled in a six-week program. That's just not going to be enough. And so really what I think we need to do is, is um, find strategies, and I thank all the funding partners who have been here today, that can help us do these very large population-based studies. And what do we need in local communities? We need these local communities to just be proving that they can get fruits and vegetables and other healthy foods to the people that need them in a way that works for them. And the analogy I like to use here is aspirin. We know aspirin prevents heart attacks. We don't ask every hospital in the United States to reprove that an aspirin given in their emergency room prevents heart attacks. All we ask the hospital to do is to show us that they were able to administer the aspirin in a way that the patient took it. And we found ourselves in this moment a little bit in this situation where we're asking every local community to prove that their local program works to prevent cancer, to prevent cardiovascular disease, to prevent diabetes. And I want us to back up from that and say we need to prove that we can get a good product to patients in the community in the way that they want. And, um, and then, thank you, the harder part of that is uh, the question around cost effectiveness and return on investment. And so for that harder part, Dory, I'm going to turn it to you. Yeah, so you, you mentioned cost. And I think this is also something that's both a promise and a pitfall of, of food as medicine discussions, right? There's definitely a promise that this is going, could be cost savings for some patients. And there's clear evidence, I think, from medically tailored meals for extremely sick uh, high utilization patients, for example, that that will reduce hospitalizations and ED visits and probably reduce net costs. So I think there will be circumstances in which food as medicine actually reduces um, cost. But I want to make the point for people who aren't healthcare wonks that almost nothing in healthcare saves money right now. And so we shouldn't hold food as medicine to a different standard than we hold all the rest of healthcare. Uh, <laughs> Food, the healthcare system costs the country $4.5 trillion, right? It doesn't save us any money. It costs us $4.5 trillion a year. And so the question is for everything we do in healthcare, is it cost effective? How does it compare to another decision in, in its cost? What amount of health are we buying for, for that cost? That's the important question for food as medicine, not cost savings. Cost savings is going to be miraculous, and anything that's cost savings we should just do, full stop. If we're improving health, and we're improving health equity and we're improving uh, saving money, we should do it. But the more challenging question is, I don't think many food as medicine programs are going to save money net, but they are going to be cost equivalent to blood pressure uh, treatment and control, to cancer screening control, to cholesterol screening control. And they're going to be cost savings relative to other very expensive treatments. Uh, and so I think this is going to be a really interesting question. And I just want all of us, as we talk about food as medicine, to policymakers, to payers, to funders, uh, to think about that. Um, I will say that it also raises the challenge of, of food as medicine for capitated patient populations, right? If you have a patient population, Medicaid or Medicare uh, uh, Advantage or, or shared savings program where, where you're a payer or your provider and you only get a set amount of money for your patient, then it really becomes trickier to, to decide what to do. So it's not e easy in black and white. But I do think this issue of cost is really important. And I think the, the elephant in the room in a positive way, actually, is the GLP-1 agonist. And people have been talking about these GLP-1 agonists, these expensive weight loss drugs and diabetes drugs. They're amazing medications. They're really a, a, the first ever real advance in drug treatment for obesity. Not everybody can take them. Only about one in four patients will still be on them at one year. Uh, patients right now are regaining weight if they go off the drug immediately. And they're unbelievably expensive. They're not cost savings for sure, and they're not cost effective by any cost savings metric that, that you, you can think of. So these are not cost effective drugs, but they're being used. And so here's where I think food as medicine can be very powerful. How can we create a combined program where a patient gets the GLP-1 for a year, loses the weight, and then gets maintained as possible on a food as medicine program? If you took 1,000 patients and you could get 500 of them off a of GLP-1 after a year, you would save $6 million a year in GLP-1 costs. 
That more than pays for food as medicine for 500 people, right? More than enough. So the, these drugs are so astronomically expensive uh, that I think that's a really exciting potential innovation where food as medicine could really make a difference. So we've talked a lot in this conference about um, health equity um, and that being important and food security and the challenges of, of food insecurity. Um, Hillary, where, can you talk a little about why food as medicine might have a particular role in health equity? Yeah, one of the things that we haven't stated explicitly today, and I think it's important to ground us in, is that the prevalence, the risk of diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and many cancers uh, is much, much higher in low-income communities, black and brown communities. And these are the same communities that experience the highest risk of food insecurity. So done right, these food as medicine interventions, I think, can be really powerful as a tool to help us support more health equity. But there's a catch here, I think, and the catch is that we know, and this is very evidence-based, this isn't my personal opinion, we know from the evidence that if we don't intentionally design programs for the lowest resource populations, the greatest benefit is going to go to higher resource populations. So one of the key data and evidence questions I think we need to really be wrestling with is how do we make sure that those lowest resourced patients, the food insecure patients, are really at the center and are at the core of this work? So that's one, I think, really important equity consideration uh, here. The second is whenever we're talking about putting a system or a structure in place, and I want to say I am incredibly excited by the um, systems uh, that have been talked about today or that are implied in the work that HHS is, is uh, thinking about carrying out. But I think it's always critical that we ask ourselves who is going to be left out. And who is going to be left out of the system that we're talking about today? It's going to be people who are uninsured. I think it's going to be people who live in states that did not expand Medicaid. And it's going to be a whole lot of people who do not qualify for, um, for Medicaid but still are low income. And I think we really have to keep these people in mind because they are the people who are not going to have access to uh, the services that we're talking about today. And then I'll just quickly mention one other um, equity issue, which is as we're designing these programs, I think it's really important that we keep in mind that we don't want access to these programs to be contingent on having um, good resources in your community already. We want, if you live in a rural community that has poor food access, that can't also be a community that doesn't have access to a food as medicine intervention. We have to solve that systems problem. And so we really have to think about this as uh, not just a food as medicine healthcare problem or challenge, but one that really brings together the public health system, the healthcare system, and uh, really importantly, the local food system and the agricultural system. Yeah, uh, and, and thinking about all of those systems, right, we, this could be beneficial in a virtuous loop for the farmers, for the retailers, for the food manufacturers, for the hospitals, for the patients, for the costs. What are, the, what are some of the challenges that the field faces here? What are some of the trade-offs in thinking about how to build a food as medicine system? So I think whenever we start designing a system, we start hitting up against tensions, we are trying to balance the needs of many, many different sectors. And the things that are rising to the surface in my own work are, for example, um, providing services by local community-based organizations that have a ton of experience working in communities, reaching people who are food insecure, providing access to culturally tailored services versus the need to scale quickly uh, and to do that often in a way that doesn't allow for local, um, uh, local tailoring, but allows us to reach everybody in the United States um, really quickly. That's a hard challenge. How much can we be hyper-local at the same time as we are scaling? And that's a big data um, and evidence, a place where data and evidence can really come to the fore as, as well. The second um, real tension, I think, is whether we are designing food as medicine programs for treatment or for prevention. And I might say that a little bit differently. Are the populations that we're really interested in reaching people with poorly controlled diabetes, people have already been hospitalized with, conject with congestive heart failure, or are they children? 
who have not yet had the opportunity to develop diabetes or cardiovascular disease, but for whom we might change the trajectory of their entire life course. These are especially important questions because the healthcare sector is telling us they need to balance their budget in a year. And if they're, you're looking to balance your budget in a year, maybe you can make a cost-effective program with preventing congestive heart failure hospitalizations because they're super expensive. But you're never going to be able to do that if you're working, providing food as medicine programs for children in order to prevent a case of diabetes 30 years from now. And so I think we really need to think about how much of our investment do we want to be at the stage of treatment and how much do we want to be investing upstream uh, in using food as medicine like a public health um, intervention. And I know the people at the CDC can help us think about that as well. So with that, Dari, I'm going to ask you where you think the field needs to go next, what people aren't at the table that we need to drive the evidence and the science forward, and what kind of stakeholders we need. Well, I think this conference, and, and we should have said this at the beginning, thank you to Secretary Becerra and also to Secretary Vilsack, who are here for, the, for, their, for their leadership. I think this conference shows that a lot of the stakeholders are actually here, not all of them, but I think that, that's, that's great. So I think the field, we really need to think about um, kind of the food as medicine pyramid that's been talked about. We, we have to, at the, at the base, we have to be sure there's effective public health and population level programs. And so I think that means really robustly supporting uh, and, and funding things like the CDC and their surveillance programs. We have to have surveillance. We have to know what people are eating. We have to know disease conditions. We have to know food security and nutrition security rates and so on. So we have to have surveillance. We have to have good community level programs uh, that, that implement what work. Uh, and we also have to leverage uh, the USDA's um, nutrition programs for the elderly, SNAP, WIC, and, and school meals to be sure that they're maximally advancing both food security and nutrition security. And I think there's room for, for much more better use of all of those dollars um, at, at the base. I think that's really, really important. I think the second thing we need absolutely is, 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 is more science. Um, there's a lot we know, and we can certainly implement the things we know. And at the same time, there's a lot we don't know. There's a lot we don't know about certain disease conditions. There's a lot we don't know about implementation science. There's a lot we don't know uh, about dose and duration and these many other things. And so I think it's imperative that the National Institutes of Health have the appropriate resources externally and have the appropriate you know, drive and leadership internally to really push this field forward across all the institutes with uh, you know, additional uh, uh, coordination from the NIH director's office. And USDA, which has a $3 billion amazing research program, I think USDA has already been moving toward thinking about the intersections of agricultural production, uh, human health, and, and sustainability. And Sally Rocky has talked a lot about that. Um, I think that's a really, really important thing that all of USDA should think about. Every dollar they spend on research somehow contributing to this intersection of human health, planetary health, and farmers' uh, product productivity. So I think research is, is absolutely essential. And we haven't really ever had a major investment in nutrition science uh, or, or research in, in this country. And I think it's time for that. And then, and then I think you know, last is, is healthcare, right? And how do we actually do all the research in, in healthcare? And there's a lot to do there to understand you know, medically tailored meals and, and produce prescriptions and groceries and how they work and for whom. Uh, I think that uh, patients with you know, type 2 diabetes and high-risk pregnancy and, and heart failure and end-stage renal disease are probably the, the, you know, the, the most immediate ROI that we can see, both clinically and health-wise. But then we're going to start to get to all these other questions, as you said, for prevention and pre-diabetes and younger children. And that's going to require the healthcare system being, being involved. And we're not going to be able to do that research study by research study, right? We're going to have to do that at the state level, at the federal level. And so, you know, really expanding these pilots across the states. Every state should have a Medicaid 1115 waiver testing and implementing and innovating food as medicine. And right now, uh, 20 states have some aspect of nutrition services and 1115 waivers. About 10 of those 20 states have actual food as medicine interventions uh, in them. So that's great, but it's only 10 out of 50. We also need to involve Medicare uh, Part B, right? Medicare shared savings can, can implement food as medicine. Medicaid can do it through in lieu of services or 1115 waivers. But Medicare Part B, which most elderly Americans are insured by, doesn't have you know, any lever for food as medicine. And so I think that's really important. And Congress is, bi there's bipartisan support in Congress for, for doing that as well. Uh, and then, of course, there's the private payers and the commercial plans. And we've talked a lot about low-income Americans, but middle-class Americans and even you know, upper-middle-class Americans have a lot of disease and a lot of poor nutrition. 
And there's a lot of interest from commercial plans and self-employed employer, large employers, uh, for, for implementing food as medicine. And I think that's also really exciting, and so having employers. And then lastly, we need all the innovative vendors who are gonna help us do this, the nonprofits, the for-profits who are in this space. And th that's a positive thing because there are trillions, not billions, trillions of dollars being left on the table that are being spent in healthcare at cost that we don't need to be spending. And so if we can learn how to leverage food as medicine from the population all the way through to healthcare, to get some of those dollars back, right? We, we're gonna make a lot of investors very happy. And so I think the, invest, the investors are gonna to start to enter this space more and more as well. Great, so um, we'll do just a final thought. Um, and I'm gonna leave with one final thought, which is um, one of, the, I've been really inspired by the collaboration here. One avenue of collaboration we haven't talked about is the opportunity for co-enrollment in SNAP and Medicaid. Very, it, the data suggests that would be a really powerful strategy for food as medicine, so we can't forget that one. Do you have a closing and thought? And I'm just gonna leave a quick closing thought. I'm a cardiologist, I see, you know, still see patients in, in clinic, and several years ago, when there was a lot of news about farmed versus wild salmon, a patient came in and said, you know, should I be eating farmed or wild salmon? I said, they're both good for you, they're both good choices, and they said, yeah, but I've heard farmed salmon might have some more PCBs and dioxins and some contaminants in them than wild salmon, and maybe the, the, the feed is a little bit different. You know, which one should I, should I, be, should I be eating? And I looked at the patient and I said, stop smoking. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> so, so, you know, I think big, the big picture stuff that we know how to do, like, it's not, compl it's not rocket science, right? And so don't, let's not get caught up in all the little weeds and let's do the big picture things that we know that work, yeah. Thank you to Hillary and Dari for your leadership and your insightful comments. Uh, to continue this conversation, we're going to welcome our next panel to the stage to talk a little bit about how food as medicine programs are designed and are implemented from a policy perspective. Uh, to share their insights, we welcome uh, Anan Parikh, the Chief Medical Advisor for the Bipartisan Policy Center. He's our lead panelist and he's joined by Rocco Perla and Rebecca Oni, uh, co-founders of the Health Initiative along with Michelle Shippey, Food as Medicine Director, the Indiana Department of Health, and Emily Broadlieb, Faculty Director, Center for Health and Law and Policy Innovation at the Harvard Law School. Thanks so much. Rose, thank you so much for that uh, introduction, and uh, thank you to the department once again for hosting this wonderful summit. Thank you for all, all of you who are watching, who are here, and for your leadership. Uh, we are going to continue the conversation. I think Hillary and Dari set us up really well. Uh, this panel is focused on really two words, policy and sustainability. And we have four terrific, terrific experts who are going to guide us through this. And, and essentially the theme of this panel is how do we make food as medicine come alive? We've heard a lot of great information this morning. How do we actually make it happen? So we'll have a initial level setting question about barriers, how do we unlock the potential of food as medicine? And then we're gonna quickly get into solutions. What is the key solution to unlock the system uh, and really advance food as medicine in this country? And, and I'll start uh, from my perspective at the Bipartisan Policy Center, um, just to, to make a few framing comments. Uh, we recently engaged in, in a project um, focusing on just this advancing policy uh, led by former Agriculture Secretaries Dan Glickman, Ann Veneman, former Senator Bill Frist, and former HHS Secretary Donna Shalala. And in the two areas of, of concern um, that, that our working group, and, and Dari and many others were, were on this group, uh, found, the first is, is simply a lack of knowledge. This, this phrase, food is medicine, yet some people understand it you know, really well and they, really quickly, but for others, there's still some ambiguity. The, the, the notion that poor diet now is the leading risk factor for mortality in the United States, and this is new since 2019. For decades, it was cigarette smoking. But now poor diet is the leading risk factor for mortality in the United States. Most patients, the public, even healthcare professionals, actually don't, don't know that. And so lack of knowledge about nutrition, food is medicine amongst healthcare professionals. We'll talk about it during this panel. There's a panel coming up focused squarely on educating healthcare professionals. Lack of education amongst patients. I mean, just look at 
dietary guidelines for Americans and knowledge of that and adherence to that amongst the public. So there is a, there is a concern about a challenge about lack of, of knowledge. The second is sort of just the mechanism of how do you insert or embed all of these evidence-based food as medicine interventions into our messy healthcare sector, whether that is a patient in front of you seeing if they're eligible for WIC and SNAP, getting them in the program, whether it's an individual with obesity uh, who could benefit from intensive behavioral uh, counseling, uh, getting them a referral, uh, whether it's a patient who could benefit from medical nutrition therapy, whether it's connecting someone to, as we've heard today, medically tailored meals or medically tailored groceries or produce prescriptions, all of these evidence-based interventions, what's the delivery mechanism, what's the financing mechanism, what's the workforce required, how do we connect the healthcare entity with the community-based organization and food partner. You know, in prevention, we talk a lot about let's make the, the healthy choice the easy choice. Here, how do we make these healthy practices the easy practices? How do we simplify it so we can routinize it and get it in um, to, to the way that we practice um, healthcare. And so with that, just a couple of, of, of initial framing questions. And, and now I'll turn um, again to just a terrific, terrific panel. And let's start, uh, maybe Rebecca, we can start with, with you. You know, when you think of, and I mentioned a couple, but, but there could be many others, the biggest sort of challenge that's stopping us. We know that we want to do this, but what, what's stopping us? Um, yeah, I was thinking about the question that Secretary Becerra asked earlier today, which I keep thinking about, you know, his, like, where do we go from here? And so as a bit of context, uh, 25 years ago, I asked physicians at a chaotic hospital in Boston, what's the one thing your patients most need to be healthy? And they said, you know, every day we have patients that come in, there's an ear infection, we prescribe antibiotics, but we know that the family can't afford food as medicine, and so we practice a don't ask, don't tell policy. And it seemed that we should be able to design a healthcare system that actually addressed what people needed to be healthy. So I uh, launched, and then with Rocco led Health Leads, enabling physicians to ask their patients, what do you need to be healthy? And then prescribe those things, like fruits and vegetables. And then one day I got this email from Dr. Jack Geiger, who said, you know, I wanted to share an historical precedent dating back 45 years, when I and other physicians at the nation's first community health center in the Mississippi Delta literally wrote prescriptions for food, and patients would then take them to the local grocery store, which would charge the pharmacy budget of the clinic. And of course, when the federal agency that was funding Dr. Geiger's clinic found out, they sent down a couple of bureaucrats to tell him that they had intended their dollars to be used for medical care. And he responded famously, the last time I checked my textbooks, the specific therapy for malnutrition was food. So what's super frustrating is that was 50 years ago, right? 50 years after Dr. Geiger writes those first produce prescriptions, after a truckload of research, as was just talked about, confirming that indeed healthy food has an impact on disease burden and medical costs, you know, we still have a healthcare system that makes it harder than easier uh, for patients to get the basics they need to be healthy. And, you know, really there's sort of two key barriers that, that I'll speak to and two things that CMS could do in the next six to 12 months that would make this radically easier. The first is a total no-brainer. So right now, health plans are super confused about whether the payments that they make for drivers of health screening, navigation, and benefits, like food as medicine interventions, whether those count to the medical loss ratio, numerator, or denominator. If they count to the numerator, plans are incented to act, and if they count to the denominator, they anticipate a penalty. So this is a huge issue, and CMS actually has said that it wants to clear this up, but its guidance is still fuzzy and fragmented, and plans are left worrying that they're gonna inadvertently trip fraud wires. So what CMS should do is consolidate its guidance into a single source, like a health plan management system memo, and confirm once and for all that when plans pay for drivers of health screening, navigation and benefits, and food as medicine interventions, those are not administrative costs, and they should count to the MLR numerator. I never thought there would be applause for the medical loss ratio. <laughs> but there should be, because it's really important. Do you, do you want to just take just 30 seconds to explain sort of the, 
medical loss rate, that 85%. Sure, and, and I have to say, like, this is, you know, Rocco and I were agonized about it because this stuff is super technical, but it is literally the thing that stands between here and there, right? So, you know, basically under the ACA, health plans have to spend 85% of member premiums on medical care. Um, and so the whole question is, like, when plans pay for things, is it medical care or is it an administrative cost? And it is... Uh, by appearances, unresolved, whether paying for the exact things we've been talking about all day are um, count as medical care or health care or count as administrative costs, and that specifically is getting in the way of plans. The other thing I'll just say really quickly is the second thing that CMS could do that would totally operationalize, which HHS has said, which is it wants plans to work with backbone organizations and community-based organizations who know best how to address health-related social needs, one thing that CMS could do is actually use its value-based insurance design model to incentivize health plans to source drivers of health benefits, like food as medicine interventions, from community-based organizations, small disadvantaged businesses, and small farmers. And specifically, it could ask plans to report the percentage of drivers of health benefits spending that it sources locally and then use an upward adjustment of STARS measures, which is the main thing plans care about, to incentivize them to increasingly source uh, drivers of health benefits locally. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. Rocco. Thanks, Nathan. That, that's a great framing uh, that you provide. So in 2011, I was asked to help create and lead the new CMS Innovation Center. And while we began to fix the healthcare system, we really struggled to address the realities of patients' lives. We penalized doctors if they're diabetic patients weren't taking their medicine, but we never asked if those patients were making trade-offs between buying food and buying medicine. After I left the government, I first encountered food insecurity data, and I can remember thinking, oh man, I've been working on health reform for five years, and I didn't know food insecurity data existed. And then we wondered why we weren't seeing the type of outcomes that we all had hoped uh, and anticipated. Ten years later, food insecurity clearly has the attention of the healthcare system, but it's not integral to how we pay for and deliver healthcare. The administration has an incredible opportunity right now to accelerate the food as medicine agenda by enabling health plans to cover and pay for food-related benefits, but it's inadvertently making it harder, not easier to do that by sending mixed signals. So the White House recently declared that food as medicine interventions, including medically tailored meals and produce prescriptions, and this is a quote, can effectively treat or prevent diet-related health conditions and reduce food insecurity. And CMS totally agrees. In their guidance and rules, they provide uh, absolute clarity that food is a health-related social need, a social determinant of health, a social driver of health, and they provide dozens of citations justifying the link between access to healthy food and clinical outcomes, costs, and disparities. So when CMS says that Medicare Advantage plans can pay for primarily health-related supplemental benefits, which they define as a service or item that must diagnose, prevent, or treat an illness or injury, you would think that food definitely counts. But CMS has also said that a supplemental benefit is not primarily health-related if it's used for social determinants purposes. That makes no sense to me. Maybe it makes sense to someone else. Um, but that ambiguity in regulation is lethal, and it's leading health plan actuaries to move away from investments in food-related benefits because they're not sure what's going on. The administration could clarify a lot of this by stating what we all know is true, and that is access to healthy food is, of course, primarily health-related. And more specifically, CMS could provide guidance to Medicare Advantage plans stating that food-related supplemental benefits meet the criteria for primarily health-related. That one move alone would be a game-changer. Can I ask just a quick follow-up question about Ro Rocco from your CMMI experience, and then, Rebecca, you brought up the VVID model. Do you think that CMS and the Innovation Center, do they need to launch a new model on food as medicine, whether it's what Congressman McGovern was talking about, Senator Marshall, or embedding food as medicine into sort of VBIT and existing models, they could do it that way. I love that question. The answer is uh, no and then yes. So no, we don't need a new model. We need to integrate it into the core reform models, not special projects or side projects. So build it into ACOs, build it into Medicaid managed care, build, build it into the, you know, the 
VBID model, which is a, an on-ramp to Medicare Advantage flexibility. So if we build this into the actual mechanisms of how we pay for and deliver care, that's the win, not endless pilots where these things are sort of on the periphery. Great, Great. thank you. Michelle. Great. Well, I'm going to have a little bit different perspective as an implementer. Um, and thank you to Andy with the CDC for a shout out of our program in Marion County. And to all of those implementers that are out here um, and commend the hard work and the complexity it is to actually like start a program and do it. Um, we've had to be innovative and these solutions that Rocco and Rebecca mentioned would be big fixers for that. Um, but as an implementer, I'm, I'm within the public sector. I worked 16 years with the local Marion County Health Department, which is in Indianapolis, Indiana. Just recently moved into a brand new food as medicine director position with our Indiana Department of Health. Um, and as we talk about braided funding later, which is funded through SNAP Ed, so you can be created through those PSE work. Um, a lot of the the challenges that we have obviously is, is funding and especially when you think about some of the community-based organizations that we work with sort of as this hub um, it's very time consuming in regards to fundraising and applying for large-scale grants and things like that such as um, CDC's and USDA grants and so utilizing your local health departments and even your state health departments can sort of alleviate some of that um, as well. And so we want to be able to support the CBOs and those sorts of things. Um, and even like thinking about some of the challenges on the staff for the responsibilities of actually managing those grants and the auditing piece of it, uh, we see that quite a bit as well. And then um, the last few points I'll make is, is capacity. And as we continue to think about food as medicine being integrated within the healthcare system, one thing we've noticed is the onboarding of healthcare systems is very difficult because of their capacity. Um, they don't have like a point of contact person and they're sort of using this in kind um, of their time from our dietitians to our social workers to our community health workers uh, because there's various personnel roles and responsibilities that have to be set from somebody referring to enrolling to providing the nutrition education to then like submitting the data. Um, and so being able to streamline a lot of that within a public sector can be very helpful. Um, and then as mentioned before in other panels, just the infrastructure building, if we can get the infrastructure and that system built and stuff, then it's gonna be a lot easier on the implementation piece of, of these types of programs. And then the last thing I'll mention is, is technology. And technology, that can be from many sectors, from EMRs and that community clinical linkage piece um, from point of sale systems when you're looking at the technology of processing produce prescription incentives and, and those sort of things. Um, so that's going to take a lot of money and investment as well. I, I was asking Michelle Wright before we got on stage about this notion, Rebecca, you may want to talk about this also, community care hubs, this idea that to support community-based organizations and food partners, if there was some entity that could take on the role of data collection and, and, and billing and, and quality, uh, quality review. That would make it a lot easier. Of course, that infrastructure would have to be built. Could local health departments do that? They would have to be financed and supported. Uh, but there seems to be some infrastructure people are thinking, of, at least thinking about, would need to be built to connect healthcare and community-based organizations. I don't know if you want to yeah, absolutely. And that's, and it might not work in every area, you know, we're, we're in an urban setting, so we have a very large local health department. Um, but the fact that we're able to get through a lot of the documentations and contracts and data use agreements and stuff as that hub to be able to then work with the CBOs and to work with even your um, private sectors and as well as then your healthcare partners and, and you're a covered entity too. So then there's some of that alleviating some of that confusion that there may be in regards to HIPAA compliance and stuff like that. So um, I like the idea. I think we, we're starting to visualize that too at the state level, which is gonna be really my job in, in collecting and landscape scanning the work that's happening in our state and be able to build that system. Um, and the one unique thing with Indiana is, you know, we just recently had um, a new appropriation for public health funding, and it's huge. And I think as you think about, you know, public health funding within your communities and your state, that that in itself with chronic disease prevention can be a huge win. 
Yeah, just to say a quick thing on this, I really appreciate this. Hillary um, did a great job of sort of framing the dilemma of like, you know, do we work with community-based organizations that we probably all recognize are far better positioned to meet the real needs of real people, but then there's the challenge of scale, right? And the backbone organizations begin to get at that. I will just say, I mean, again, you know, this is not about like, you know, sort of radical acts, but it is really about being clear on the commitments. And I know, um, Dr. John Lumpkin is here from Blue Cross Blue Shield, North Carolina, and you know, really just like admiring of the work that the plan did where um, it's super easy to contract with a big national food vendor, right? It is way trickier to say like, we are gonna actually keep these dollars in state and you know, the degree of investments that um, Blue Cross Blue Shield made in North Carolina to really say like, we understand there's gonna need to be both you know, a set of contractual relationships, but there's also gonna need to be a set of concurrent investments that allow community organizations to be able to be effective partners and again when we think about the opportunities CMS has to leverage some of its models to begin enabling plans to, to test that experiment with it and be incented to do that would be huge great Emily thank you so it's great listening to everyone I'm nodding along with everything so <laughs> I'm gonna you know give a hearty plus one to everything that was expressed and then add on a little um, so for those that don't know, um, the Center for Health, Law, and Policy Innovation, we're in a law school. Our expertise is really law and policy, and the work that we do is across two programs, one really focused on food, food law and food policy, and one on health law and health policy. As you can imagine, this is really our sweet spot, this area, coming from those two fields. Um, but all the work that we really do is very much trying to provide legal and policy answers and resources to partners on the ground. So that's you know individual community-based organizations, health plans, providers, state-based coalitions, um, government. And so a lot of the answers I'm gonna give are the, the kinds of things we keep hearing from everyone. So I'm gonna give you two for this barriers question. One, the number one thing that has come up in every place where we've worked and we've built like state-based coalitions like the Food is Medicine Massachusetts and the work we've done now in New York on a similar um, plan one of the top things that's come up is the lack of knowledge of providers. So I know this was a big part of the Bipartisan Policy Center report as well. Um, you know, providers can be out there as ambassadors um, with knowledge of, of, you know, nutrition and food and diet and providing good and correct information to patients. And then even more importantly, providing referrals to dietitians and referrals to all of these programs that we've been talking about. Or they can, as they are today, um, you know, the majority of, of, of healthcare providers haven't really learned anything about diet and nutrition. There's really no requirement at any level of medical education for them to do that. So I think um, this is, you know, again, come up everywhere. There's been some recent progress. I know we had some great members of Congress here earlier. Um, Representative McGovern, we worked with closely on a resolution in the House of Representatives really calling on um, both the the government entities that work with healthcare education and then the, the education programs themselves, but a lot more needs to be done. And I think um, there are really great opportunities at the federal level to do that, including um, you know, starting from, from leading the way by having some requirements for federally employed physicians. There are, you know, we, we saw, we heard this today from the Indian Health Service. There are lots of federally employed physicians in IHS, in the VA, um, you know, really across um, different government agencies that could themselves be learning more and making sure that they're giving good information, that they're providing the pathway. That's how we are gonna unlock all of these programs. Um, and then I think another big one is the, the large majority of funding, particularly for residency programs, comes from Medicare. Um, so it makes no sense we're spending Medicare dollars to train physicians that aren't required to learn anything about diet. And I, I should say, you know, 86% of physicians report that they feel unqualified to answer questions about food and diet. Um, and then those same patients end up on Medicare that as they get older, it doesn't really make any sense. So I think there's, those are some of the opportunities. At the lower level would even just be through HHS or NIH just providing a repository of like, what are the you know modules out there? What are the CMEs out there? I see Steve DeVries, Gaples Institute has great modules that are available right now. A lot of uh, medical schools are now requiring them. Uh, but like making those available, making curricula available, let's spread it, let's make it easier. So that's one big barrier I'd say. And then um, another big one is we're answering all of these legal questions and I'm looking at my colleague Katie Garfield who I know many of you have spoken to about these legal questions. Um, but there's a lot of questions coming up um, 
Uh, HIPAA has been mentioned already. HIPAA is a, a really big area that, um, you know, we do the best that we can. We provide lots of different toolkits and guidance, like in addition to the one-on-one -on -one answering and work, working with our partners, when we know that something's a problem, we provide some guidance. But there are questions we don't have answers to. HIPAA is one where it, there's still a lot of outstanding questions about are the CBOs involved in food as medicine, covered entities, are they business associates, are they both, are they neither, you know, what are they, and then what do they need to do? And again, we're, we're sort of asking for answers on that. Another one that my team's worked on a lot as well is around um, inducements in, you know, anti-kickback statutes. And, um, and the most confusing thing for people on the ground is all of these pieces, the piece that Rebecca just talked about with medical loss ratio, that's CMS. If you're on the ground, you just want an answer. You don't know where in the federal government to go to get the answer. So I think there's a real opportunity for better, like, two-way communication around what are the questions out there, and then really centralizing the, the answers and this guidance um, so that we can kind of find out what the questions are more, more quickly, get the guidance out there, and not have everyone on the ground scratching their head. And, and again, you know, we're doing our part. We're trying when we hear of these problems and challenges, we're trying to answer what we can. But there's certain things where we can't answer for what the HHS Office of Civil Rights is going to say. That's great, great. Um, so uh, I'm so happy the panels have already gotten into solutions, uh, <laughs> and I think we want to sort of build, uh, um, build on that. Um, a, a number of the ones in our recent report, the Bipartisan Policy Center, were already uh, reference. I'm going to um, uh, I'm going to articulate a couple more, and then maybe in reverse order we can talk about some of these more. And I, I know we want to talk about blending and braiding as well. Um, I think on the education side, you've already heard a couple of of concrete policy recommendations. Uh, another one: we spend over a billion dollars on workforce training programs uh, through HHS agencies, VA, and and others. But some sort of requirement that nutrition education be built in. So the workforce training grants is, is, is sort of one. Uh, Emily mentioned sort of all federal providers having a baseline set of nutrition education. Uh, accreditation organizations in the private sector, professional societies, licensing boards, really elevating nutrition specific competencies and standards. And how about financing HHS and USDA so the dietary guidelines for Americans can be better disseminated so we can help educate and, and teach Americans about uh, the important recommendations here. On the implementation side, uh, we've already heard about things that CMS could do related to the medical loss ratio, guidance from the Office of Civil Rights on, on HIPAA. Uh, we heard a lot from Medicaid this morning. They're doing terrific work, but what about a learning collaborative so we can learn all of these states who are doing this, this work on the ground, they can share data, learn from one another. Um, the legislation is needed in Congress as well. Uh, from things from uh, intensive behavioral therapy and making sure dietitians can provide that to medi uh, uh, medical nutrition therapy and ensuring that Medicare beneficiaries with obesity-related conditions can access that service. So, so lots of sort of policy steps, and maybe we'll start in reverse order. And, and uh, Emily, why don't you go first? Uh, additional policies and solutions that, y that you want to focus on, blending or braiding or, or, or yeah. any others? Sounds good. I think um, just picking up on one other piece that you mentioned on the provider, um, you know, health professional education. And I feel badly because I know two of my great co-conspirators in this area are going to be talking about it later, so I don't want to steal all the thunder. But I should say we talked federal. I think for those of you out there working at the state level, um, states can require also continuing medical education. 37 states require specific continuing, continuing medical education in specific areas. Zero of those require anything in nutrition for, for physicians. And again, I think um, especially, you know, we heard from Michelle, like, you know, states that are putting out public health funding that are making a real commitment, that's a way to maybe have those dollars go further. So something to really think about. Um, and I know we'll hear more about, you know, there's, there's, just, there's a lot of opportunity. I think it's a great moment. Um, on the funding, I think a couple of things to say on that. Um, I think similar, in some ways, similarly to what I mentioned on some of the legal barriers. So there's like this incredible amount of creativity. I don't know if, you know, sitting through the morning, just listening, everyone's pulling funding from all these different sources. And, and I know we just heard, you know, from Michelle, like getting funding from SNAP-Ed, using that support, which can go to more PSE rather than just individual education. We heard about GUSNIP, which comes from USDA. I know there's been other USDA funding for um, through like the LAMP program for local foods that has gone to food as medicine programs. 
Um, so there's this like incredible amount of creativity. I think right now there's a real, um, like a, uh, an opportunity to really provide one place where we can see what these different funding opportunities are. And again, we saw all those, you know, agencies out here on the stage that, that were mentioning different things, sort of providing a resource that shows where can you start, where can you go, what provides funding for infrastructure. Um, that's really been a big, a big push of ours. It's been amazing um, that how CMS has really supported infrastructure through the 1115 waivers, which are incredible. There's money to really go to like building technology, building workforce, you know, making all of this happen. Um, but outside of that, there's not really support for infrastructure. So I think um, really providing like a one-stop shop that of where some of these federal dollars going that could be going towards more building the, the, the landscape for food as medicine, building the infrastructure. And then I think just one thing to say on that, because I think you know, this is where we are today. I do think it's a moment to start thinking about um, what is our next step as we have all of these 1115 waivers and other funding. You know, the point is to get data. We heard about how much data is being collected. I'm glad I'm not the one sorting through all the data. That's not what I do. But, um, but then when do we figure out some of these things? We have a good enough case that we should just make that part of Medicaid. We should make that part of Medicare and use the waivers to keep testing out new packages, new implementation with, with you know, new populations. But I think that's where we need to go, especially as we're investing in infrastructure. If those dollars are going to a five-year demonstration project and they're going to end after that, then those are dollars wasted. If they're going towards building something that we're starting to say some of this is part of our kind of mainstream coverage, then that investment really just makes a lot more sense. That's great. M Michelle? Yeah, and I appreciate you bringing up with the MNT, and I feel we've gotten a little bit with dietitians and billing codes and things like that, but it's almost stuck. So it's possible. <laughs> it can happen. Um, but in regards to the, the funding that we have been very successful with um, in regards to getting a CDC REACH grant, that really helped us build capacity at the local level to hire my position at that time to start putting this work together for food as medicine. Um, and then somebody had asked a question about ha having a resource with all the different types of fundings that could be available. I think that would be super helpful. Um, and being creative because each of the, the grants can be used for certain things. Um, they may be some restrictions whether it can cover food or not. So then that's where you apply for the GUSNIP grants and that's where you can then do majority of that funding through the food and incentive costs. Um, and then, of course, you know, the foundations and private sectors that may have be a little bit more discretionary with their funding, so you could be really flexible in where you're putting that funds and stuff at. Um, and I know it was mentioned, the idea of expanding SPAN, I think, is wonderful, and having that as a source of funding for all 50 states and territories um, and tribal communities, and because and, right now it is very competitive, so that's really exciting that that is... Um, a possibility for the future. Um, but yeah, I mean, right now, us that are implementing these programs, you have to be innovative, you have to do your research, build partnerships, make connections, um, talk to people, and um, just be really creative in the way that you're braiding that funding. So we're, we're paging the budget office here in OMB, <laughs> blending and braiding. You heard it here. Rocco. Now, I'll tell you a little bit of a different angle because I, I think uh, the two words that come to mind for me are consolidated guidance. There is so much activity uh, happening in the food as medicine related space, even from a regulatory perspective, from the research, um, that I think plan financial leadership is yearning for like the one source, you know, for all of this information and, and guidance. And that, you know, Rebecca mentioned the health, um, the HPMS memo, like that's a great place to, to start. And I think we also need to be honest with ourselves that at the end of the day, the real chief health officers are the chief actuaries. I mean, they make, they have outsized uh, decision-making relative to what actually gets paid for and, move, and moves forward. So um, I think if we can make that uh, guidance very clear, consolidated, put it in one place and say, there it is, uh, you know, get to work, I think we can have a better line of sight into what actually is viable moving forward. Sounds great. Rebecca, you have the last word. You've led so many movements around the country. So. 
I mean, just one you know quick thing is you know I was thinking about how CMS actually did this like really profound thing in the last 18 months, which is that you know since Medicare and Medicaid were created in like 1965, there had never been any measures in any federal healthcare payment programs that address the realities of patients' lives, and literally in like the span of 18 months, CMS has either proposed or enacted you know in in sort of 21 instances drivers of health measures that actually now say hospitals have to screen admitted patients for food insecurity, housing instability. That is game changing. And it feels like the equivalent action. It was so funny, I was thinking about, you know, your point about like all the, like all of this is an end run. And the thing that would actually, you know, relieve us of, of all of that sort of um, piecing together is, you know, Emily, what you were saying, which is like, make a national coverage determination that medically tailored meals or produce prescriptions are covered services. The crazy thing is CMS could do it itself, right? If I were to say to the secretary, the one thing is to ask CMS to begin its own internal national coverage determination review process for a medically tailored meal or for produce prescriptions. Um, and that would do more to reduce administrative complexity, reduce costs than probably anything else we're talking about here today. Great, thank you, Rebecca. Well, I, I think um, the, the, the theme that we're leaving you with, there's been tremendous progress, I think, on the policy front, we'd all agree, but, but there's still work to be done. So thank you for listening. We value your ideas and uh, looking forward to the next discussion on scaling. Back to Rose. Thanks so much. Thanks, Anand. Thanks to our other panelists for that great conversation on policy. I know we've, we're talking about the work HHS has done thus far. It's clear we, we still have a lot more to go, so grateful to be with you all here today. Our next panel includes individuals who have committed to investing in food as medicine programs. These panels and funds can share their thoughts on where and how private venture funds are viewing the landscape. To moderate this discussion, I am personally just so delighted to introduce Daniel Carnival, the Deputy Director for Health Outcomes at the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. Joining her on the panel today is Stephen Chen, Chief Medical Officer from Almeida County. Sanjeev Krishnan, co-founder, S2G Ventures, John Lumpkin, president, Blue Cross Blue Shield and North Carolina Foundation, and Ryan Wilson, the CEO of Boardwalk Collective. So thank you so much for this conversation, and Danielle, over to you. Thank you so much. It is great to be here, and I am so excited. This is, um, I, as mentioned, I work a lot on health. I work on cancer in particular, um, but this in particular is not my topic of expertise, and so I am going to learn right along with you. I promise you're still in good hands. I did my homework. Um, but I'm really excited to learn from these experts. Um, I mean, scale, and especially investing to scale, is how we reach the goals discussed on so many of the panels today. So that I feel like there's, the pressure is on the task here. None of the rest of it happens if we don't figure this out. Um, and so we have 35 minutes, and uh, we're, it, we're gonna get there. So um, innovation across the system obviously uh, is needed uh, to really realize this vision. I think so that we're very clear on where the rest of your comments are falling. I wanted to start with what does scale for food as medicine look like, in your opinion, and what is one thing one thing that we need to get there. I'll start here and we'll go down and then we'll d dive into the discussion on the specifics. Great, so, so say it again. What does scale look like and what how do we get there? Like? And what is one thing that we're missing that we need to get there? Um, I almost wanna start with the second part of that first. But I mean, what scale looks like to me is not that, that f nutrition is an integrated part of healthcare. Mm -hmm full stop, that it's a part of our healthcare plans, it's a part of our government policies, that we're investing in it fully, and it's just part of our cultural zeitgeist. We haven't spent a lot of time talking about that either, but we've like a cultural revolution that needs to accompany all the hard work that's happening in this room. And what happened, what I focus a lot of my time on is making sure that we are catalyzing the innovation and the investment needed to get there. And we've spent a lot of time today, I mean, the last panel talking about the creativity to find the pockets of money in the federal government to fund this, yes, but this is not the federal government's job alone. Um, there's a tremendous announcement from Rockefeller and the philanthropic sector stepping up, but I think um, the private sector, private investors, venture capital, private equity are, are poised to be really powerful partners. Great. Well, 
moving food as medicine to scale, I think, requires us to first make the business case. Um, I spent a lot of my career in public health. I know prevention works. But when you talk to an actuary, they will say, prove it. And unless we have the evidence base, and the earlier panel talked about that, but not just the evidence base that nutrition makes people better, but within the context of those who are paying for health care, that it actually does make a difference in cost and outcomes. And then once we do that, we have to think about how we build upon what's already in place. If you go to communities across our state of North Carolina and you go to a place in, up in Boone in Appalachia, in Watauga County, there's a nonprofit there called the Hunger and Health Coalition. Their food pantry, they deliver medically tailored meals, medically tailored food baskets. And if we can't think about how our food system incorporates what's already in place, then we will not bring this to scale in a meaningful way that not only impacts those patients who have funded, but preserves the nonprofit infrastructure that cares for patients who don't. Stephen, what does this look like at scale, and what is one thing that's needed? Let me add a, an adjective to the word scale. I think we need to think of our three adjectives. One is equitable scale, the other is localized scale, and the third is layered scale. Because I think food is not an app. It's not a, a product that you can just 10x and add a bias to the small segment. I think what we need to understand in healthcare is we are coming to this in a, from a humble space. Food systems is much more complex than that pill. And so uh, that requires us understanding to scale food as medicine. It's going to be a localized approach, I think. But you need to create the missing element, which is a backbone. And there's the backbone on the healthcare side, and there's a backbone on the agriculture side. On the healthcare side, it's this ecosystem and connecting health centers with food pharmacies or food sources, with pairing that with nutrition supports, with the, in our, in our work in, in Alameda County, 1115 waivers, and all of that back end. That is not easy work. I would not wish it on to a farmer or a health coach. Someone needs to do that work. We're doing it in Alameda County. There is a recipe. There is a way to do that. That's on the backbone administrative side. The data systems are not all there, and there's an opportunity for that. And then on the agricultural side, it's asking the question, where does the food come from? And how, how is it grown? And where do we center equity in that? And if we are going to grow that North Star towards a regenerative and organic practices to get us the highest nutrient food, we need to have the backbone infrastructure in place that missing middle from growers that are wanting to grow for our health systems to that last 20 foot, last mile to our patients, that supply chain infrastructure and logistics that needs to be built out. I think a lot of the same comments. I think one, <clears> that the food system is, becomes part of the standard of care conversation and you move from skepticism to less skepticism. And I think the way we do that is twofold. One, um, move from clinical data to economic data around some of the companies, what you were mentioning. And then two, that we have more integrated price signals between calories and healthcare. Because right now those price signals are very divorced. Um, and I think that will be sort of a emblematic of, of, of scale in the future. So to start, part of this change, um, as I know has been discussed, is being driven by new science, new innovation. So Ryan, Sanjeev, you see more of that part of the ecosystem. Uh, what are we seeing there? How do we, what is needed to support investment in that space? Ryan, do you want to start and then Sanjeev? Sure. I mean, it's a big old question. But um, I, there is, we, we've spent a lot of time today, and frankly, at a lot of our food as medicine conferences, talking about medically tailored meals and produce prescription, and it's super important. But there's a whole realm of innovation coming in this landscape that I think we should add into the conversation um, that needs a lot more funding because I think most of the government and philanthropic funding is going into those two categories, which is fantastic. I'm not taking anything away from that. But there are, there's a whole realm of innovation coming that also needs to be well funded and that's why I mentioned uh, our private sector and our venture capital partners and our private equity partners 
And if I can, I'll just, I, I was reflecting on, you know, I've been talking about these issues for a couple decades and sort of like got tired of myself. But a lot of times I was in rooms like this, you know, like very public health oriented conversations. And it was sort of late 2015, 2016 that I went to a finance conference and I happened to be on a, you know, a, a, a nutrition panel and I've never been met with more blank stares and rolled eyes. And I was like, oh, my people, this is a challenge. And, and you know, greeted afterwards with, with you know gentlemen saying like well sugar there's no there's no money to be made in food or you know sugar when you say climate we sort of turn stop listening I'm not, the ladies in the room know what I mean when I say sugar but um, but I was like yes so for the last seven or eight years I I have been trying to work very closely with that investment community and I'm really happy to say that the evolution has been extraordinary in a very short period of time. We have a number, I mean, Sanjeev and his team, I think, are just the epitome of, of what should happen in this space, but investing because they know it's the right thing to do and there are returns to be made and we're, Sanjeev led the um, announcement at the White House conference of the investment coalition and at the time it was 15-ish investors and now it's doubled or tripled and 160 investments have been made since that conference. I mean, they're seeing a really rapid pace of, um, uh, of investment, but we need to incentivize that investment. I think the same way that we saw this happen in green energy, we saw a lot of government partnering with industry and innovation and providing tax incentives and so forth. That's the only reason we have Tesla is we the people sort of funded that first factory with tax incentives. And now we have a robust electric vehicle you know, uh, company. And I think we need to think about where we have the opportunities to do that in this space as well. Yeah, I mean, I think what's exciting is there's a Cambrian explosion of R and R&D. Bioactives, all, these are things graduating from VMS or, or other things into medical food, um, new generation of therapeutics, et cetera. I think the more interesting thing, and, and the, one of the reasons we did the coalition is, Food systems, what, 6.5% of GDP? Healthcare is 20% of GDP. What do investors want to do? They want to invest in, in things that are bigger pies. And so I think there's a real opportunity to have the food system colonize the profit pool of the healthcare system, better patient outcomes, deflation. Now, the economic data needs to be backed up with the clinical data. But this is one of the reasons we started, because right now it's sort of lost. Food tech is considered beyond meat or impossible. Healthcare is not considered sort of food as medicine. And so we really want, with Ryan and everyone, to, to really proselytize this notion that this is one of the great economic opportunities to deflate healthcare. It's a fiscal issue, it's a healthcare issue, it's sort of a food system issue. And, and frankly, you know, 20% of US GDP is a really interesting sort of pie to go after. That's great. I I think you're already starting to get to the question of how to make the business case, but would love to bring in uh, the other panelists on, on their part, and how do you see making the business case uh, for this transition in, in your part of the system? I see the business case with food as medicine as a health multiplier effect. So if you invest in food as medicine in a way that is actually looking at the question of where the food comes from and how it's grown, you can get multiple co-benefits. Normally we, and I'm a physician, I'm in healthcare, we're very downstream, we're thinking of patients, we're thinking of health outcomes for that patient and maybe that population, and then we stop. And then we say, huh, what about the economists? What about all the other inputs? So I think the, the co-benefits are fourfold. It's a four-headed uh, hydra, if you will, for the business case. Human health, in terms of health outcomes, healthcare utilization, all of the standard stuff that we do in healthcare. Economic, um, development and well-being in our communities or economic uh, growth and wealth creation in our localized and regional communities. How does asking that question where the food comes from actually get connected to that? If you, how do you localize the food, if you will, regionalize the food, a layered approach? So that's that second part of that hydra. Uh, the third part is the climate and soil health, which gets us to the planetary health. If we grow that food regeneratively and organically or on a pathway towards that, we can start measuring questions around how much carbon is going into the ground? How are our waterways protected? How is the nutrient density of our food that we're gonna to give to our pregnant patients, or our pediatric patients, actually improve? So there's a whole climate so soil health piece. And then I'm just gonna always be pushing equity. And I, my, my, my friends always say, you have to name that because not everyone is thinking about that. And that is always how I'm thinking about it, but it has to be layered throughout those three pieces. 
human health, economic health, climate health, and soil health, and the equity piece. How is this impacting our most vulnerable patients? We take care of our most vulnerable patients, our, our, our well-resourced patients will follow. So it's uh, certainly an honor to be on this panel and to have an opportunity to talk about this critical issue that I've spent a lot of time over the last few years in trying to demonstrate. Within Blue Cross of North Carolina, we have a team, it's called the Drivers of Health Team, and this team is committed to internally within the organization to create test and learn pilots that are then analyzed, uh, we look at the data within our own members so we can look at total cost of care. And what we've seen in our initial pilot, Food Delivery Health Coaching, which we published on, shows that if we do a food-based intervention for those with diabetes, that not only do we have better hemoglobin A1C outcomes, we have better impressions of health, we have better engagement with Blue Cross of North Carolina, but also the costs go down. That's kind of the trifecta. We need to have vigorous kinds of rigorous research that demonstrates that. And that's something that Hillary and, and Dari talked about earlier today, that that body of knowledge is starting to come. We also need to think about how we convince and work with the actuaries to actually price those kinds of interventions. Because it's, actuaries think about things differently. That's the way they're trained. And if we can't speak their language, then it never makes it past, yeah, this is a good idea. The second thing about the importance of the business case is my career has been long enough for me to see fads in health and healthcare. Things that we do all the way up until the next economic downturn. And unless there's a strong business case, food as medicine will be the next thing that will get tossed on the trash pile on the next economic downturn. Finally, as we think about creating that business case, it has to expand the scope. And this is where it gets to be a challenge. Blue Cross of North Carolina is a nonprofit blues plan. So our mission is to improve the health and well-being of our customers and community. And to look beyond that one-year cycle. And I'll just give one quick example and turn it back over to you. We looked at 60,000 commercial members, commercial and ACA members, not Medicare, not Medicaid. And we compared their costs when they started off with Blue Cross and we watched them for a five-year period of time. We could do that with our data going back retrospectively. And every single year, the 9,700 members who lived in a food desert had higher total medical costs. And when we total up those costs over those five years for those 9,700 members that we looked at as part of this cohort of 60,000, the total cost was $24 million. That's real money, even in healthcare. We have to begin to think about the business case, including not only the members we have today, but the members we're going to get tomorrow. And unless we begin to not only think about business case and context of our current members, but the communities where our members live, we cannot yield the kinds of savings that ultimately will help control the rise of health care costs. Thank you for that. I know, um, since you've been right, I asked you a slightly different question. Is Do you want to add on specifically the business case here? Are there, there are things that, from your perspectives, you want to make sure are part of that answer? Yeah. I mean, it, when we started um, 10 years ago, when we talked to payers, it was, it was, there were was some incentives under the ACA. It was really around smoking cessation, exercise, these incentives. Food was not on the agenda. I do want to recognize it's, we've come a long way in 10 years. I totally hear you on, on, on sort of the fragility of the fat issue. And that's where I think we want to continue to focus, not just on clinical data, but the economic data. So one day your actuary <laughs> will change this. And that's, at that point, I think that's a tipping point, I would assume, in terms of you know, how do you think about a fat versus trend mm -hmm. is when the actuarial and the data allows you to change something like that. Yeah, I mean, I fully agree we need to continue to build the business case. Where I grow concerned is where it feels like those words are being used 
to slow progress. And I believe, I mean, Dari said it really well earlier this afternoon. We can continue to build the business case, we can continue to do the research and we'll optimize how we're executing on all of this while continuing to serve people because we are in an urgent health crisis and sometimes I feel like that gets lost when we get um, deep into building the business case conversations. I appreciated Senator, Mc or Senator I just um, promoted him, Representative McGovern's um, urgency and impatience that he expressed earlier today. Yeah, I think this gets to the, the next point that I want to bring us to. There, bridges need to be built for this system to be sustainable. And, and there's many different parts of, of the, I guess, the highways system <laughs> represented here. Um, and I think back to Ryan, something that you said, this is, we have, for a long time, uh, uh, tried to incentivize and build a business case for prevention broadly, um, uh, which was said by um, Sanjeev and, and others. Um, I think here, uh, what's interesting is that we're, that's part of the conversation. Another part of the conversation is changing society, society's um, uh, approach to food. And so food is medicine, but it's also family. It's also celebration, it, right? Like it, 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 it is not isolated in a prevention um, uh, aspect. And so from your different perspectives, how do we start to build the bridges between the innovation, between um, the uh, kind of development of new products that can help us get there and the healthcare system so that it's the, we're actually getting to that sustainable system that we're talking about? Well, I'd like to see a bridge. I mean, I, I've had the pleasure of serving on the board of a company called Territory Foods for many years, and it's a prepared meal delivery company. And for many years, our customer was not the low-income, highest-need customer, but a health and fitness energized customer. Right? These are delicious chef-prepared meals. And then with my other hats on, when I'm working on a medically tailored meal program for our Medicaid population, I'm looking at the difference in the meals. I'm like, you know, how much grilled chicken and steamed broccoli can one human eat <laughs> and still stay enthusiastic about transitioning the way they eat. And so I would like to see more of our sort of for-profit companies that have a tremendous treasure trove of data about what people love to eat. What if they eat twice a week, will they be more likely to stick to the program and all that and share that with some of the programs that are out there so that everybody in these programs, regardless of income or need, has access to delicious, craveable, sort of culturally resonant, not just at the higher income levels in the for-profit companies and the for-profit programs. So I, you know, I think we, we need to look at a strong partnership between the for-profit and non-profit food systems. And that means we understand that in many times, North Carolina is the eighth largest agricultural state in the nation. And most of our food gets sent out of state where it gets processed, reprocessed, and overprocessed to the point where it returns to no longer healthy food. Reverend Joyner is sitting right over there in his community, works with churches, works with kids, and they grow healthy food that's available 500 boxes a week that goes out to local people who are discharged from the local hospital. That's a local food system. And that local food system aggregates up. There are regional food hubs, like the one in uh, Mitchell County, which is in Appalachia in, in North Carolina. And they provide CSA boxes, but they also do it for people who can't afford food. And they provide half of the income for 70 small farmers in Mitchell County. So there's an interconnectedness that goes there. But from a health plan basis, when we have a patient who's discharged from the hospital, we want to make sure they get a box, they get a meal exactly when they need it. And that's not always the strength of a nonprofit. But those two organizations, those two entities working together in a system creates a more sustainable way to support local agriculture local nonprofits with partnership through the for-profit system. And I think that's what it takes to be sustainable. I'm still stuck on that actuarial question. <laughs> <laughs>
I do want to just say two thoughts on that and then maybe speak to this. I, yeah. This question of, this is why I was saying it's a four-headed monster or four-headed hydra, because, you know, we in healthcare, we're being actuarially just within healthcare, but what about all the other costs um, and externalities and the economic side? So how do we actually scope out and say, yes, we understand the actuarial piece within healthcare. What's the actuarial piece in the economic side? What's the actual piece on the climate side? And actually look at all of those pieces. And then what are the metrics to measure that inequity, right? So I guess I know this is a newer space, and I know that we tend to want to confine, well, this is what my part of the swim lane is, but I'm, I guess I'm really trying to challenge us to say the business case has to go beyond one swim lane because it's dealing with food and the intersection of healthcare, and it's not a, just a pill. Um, and then I guess the second piece is GLP-1s, I understand from our actuaries, are about 1400 a month. For how long? Our food, our food, our medically supported food is maybe about 160 to $200 a month. What's the math there? Right, almost 10x. How long are you going to do this for? I think that that one example is one simple way. I know I'm not an actuary. I'm not an economist, so I'm probably oversimplifying. But there's some, some things that seem kind of like, how do, you, how, do you, how do you reckon that? How do you reconcile that? So, Sorry, I didn't take the other question. I want to make sure. It seems like Sanjeev wants to answer, so I can come back to my piece on that other yeah. question. Yeah, I mean, I think everything the panelist said is valid. One thing to consider, the most cliche thing venture capitalists like me say is disruption. Um, and we define disruption as changes in market share. And the number one R coefficient to market share changes and volatility is when the channel gets digitized. And um, not just Netflix or Spotify, but even like consumer batteries. What COVID did was really give people the view of the, of, the, of the last mile of the food system getting digitized. Mm -hmm. whether, whether it's Instacart, Uber Eats, DoorDash, or Amazon, Walmart, et cetera. <coughs> and I think that trend, and I know it's, we've gone back and not as much, but I do think it allows you to, to, to mass customize, to meet people where they are culturally, economically, geographically, and understand what would, not just eating chicken and broccoli, although that's what I had, I think. <laughs> Two days ago. Um, but like really understand and, and improve adherence, which I think is what, where you're going with this. And I do think that theme of digitalization is not going away. And so how do you pair that with nutrition, medical food, clinical data, economic data? You've now got a delivery model, literally, that you can do that. And I think that's why companies like Amazon and Walmart are interested in healthcare, because I do think they see that as a marriage of food, pharmacy, and potentially services. Stephen, did you want to talk to the how you built the bridges? Yeah, I mean, I think the, there is a, that's my piece on this layered scale piece. Um, I think you need to have your um, kind of training and administrative hub to bring this ecosystem together because healthcare doesn't talk to food teams and food teams don't talk to community-based uh, health coaches and health plans and all of the regulations around billing and claiming, if we're gonna, like we are using LEM15 waivers, they don't talk to all these CBOs, like you're saying, community-based organizations. So you need to start somewhere, maybe it's local, but maybe there's also a national pay, a place for this uh, administrative and training hub piece. Um, and then the data systems behind that. Um, to move one of our, my prescription and clinic, and to get that to not only the patient and all the food and all the, uh, the delivery of the services, but to make that an authorized service that goes through uh, the billing and claiming system is no easy task. It's, it's really lots of, um, lots of detail. It's, not in, it's, 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 it's very, a lot of detail that a farmer wouldn't do. And so that, I think, is maybe where there's a lot of opportunity for some private support on the data systems and the data, data flows. But build the infrastructure so that the local communities can grow and scale. Don't abstract or extract it. Uh, centrally, there is a role certainly for large, you know, companies that, that can fill those spaces uh, where the localized communities aren't ready to do it, and it takes time. Um, but let's just make sure that local communities and equity is not left behind. I could just jump in there really quickly because really important point. I can't think of a single physician I know who says they really like the way the medical system, the healthcare system, works. Not a policymaker. That's why we're talking about moving to you know, value-based purchasing and value-based care. So as we move into the food as medicine system and we engage in nonprofits, let us not 
impose that system on them. Let them do what they do well. These are places, you, you go to a food pantry, they've been getting food to people who have medical illnesses, they've been getting food to people who don't have access for decades. Let us figure out how to pay them for what they do without them having to hire an account. That really, I think, is going to be a critical part of being sustainable. So thank you for that. In our uh, remaining few minutes, part of scalability, part of investment is uh, capturing the imagination in, in uh, kind of inspiring uh, what change looks like. So uh, I would love to go down and hear down the line and hear from each of you an example that you think does that, an example worth wanting to invest in scaling. I'll start at the other end because I've, I've pointed at Ryan first too many times. Um, so Sanjeet, I mean, Sanjeet, I'm sorry. Yeah, there's, there's a whole host of new bioactives like, that help with women's bone loss, that help with immune re rejuvenation, that helps sort of um, cancer metabolism. There, there's, a, there's, there's, there's a lot of great companies. There's one company in our portfolio out here called Norristar X. They're helping um, plans with both improving patient lives, saving them money, and creating value for the taxpayer. Um, and so I think there's, there's a great number of stories to tell, and, and I'm really glad that HHS has decided to do this, because I think we need to create more of those stories um, of patient lives and the economic model. Steven? I imagine a day where we have uh, 11 states, the 1115 waivers, um, all participating together in an equity-centered regenerative food as medicine model. What that looks like is what we have in Alameda County. I'm just, you know, a little, little pride in our county and what we've already done. Uh, we are engaging the first ingredient, which you can adapt to your, your systems, federally qualified health centers, as a place of equity where this begins. You connect these, uh, this first ingredient to a second ingredient, which is our food system. We call it food pharmacy. It's our local nonprofit farm, BIPOC-led, growing food regeneratively and organically. We can do that across the nation. Uh, the third part is to pair the food with the coaching and nutrition coaching and behavioral coaching to sustain this work in our patients' lives beyond that prescription. We can do that. We have models to do that. The fourth one is the uh, health plans, uh, the health plans, the Medicaid health plans that want to do this work together. And then the fifth one is kind of like a nationalized recipe for health at team, like what we're doing in Alameda County, but you scale it nationally. And you, you bring the, in, the teams that are ready to do this, and you're going to have quick impact on those four, um, those four co-benefits, right, to human health, economic health, climate health, and equity. There's a science fiction writer named Gibson who said, the future is here, it's just not everywhere. And that, I think, is some of the examples when we think about what really could be exciting in innovation. Tomorrow, Blue Cross of North Carolina is rolling out our first food delivery. We call it Feed Your Health Program in three of our product lines. And we're doing it in partnership with Nourish RX. And part of our contractual requirement with them was that as they build out this system for our members, that they will engage the nonprofit sector in the food delivery build up a nonprofit delivery system as part of that. I think that's the future. It's not one, it's not the other, it's both working together. This is a huge problem. It's a huge challenge. But when you think about what we can achieve by improving the health of people in our country in a way that leads to significant improvement that you can't just see with a drug that if you, don't, if you stop taking it, you're going to lose weight. A different approach to eating and health. That, I think, is the future. Final word, no pressure. Um, no, no, no. I mean, like Sanjeev, I work with a company that's identified a bioactive that can reverse fatty liver disease. I mean, there are really exciting things like that that are com coming and could be game changing. And then I think more directly to today's conversation with territory foods, we've taken seven years of experience and 
I don't want to get it. I think the CEO might be here. An announcement is coming. <laughs> um, but we have a platform now where we can work with a FEM space. We can work with payers. We can work with others. We can deliver that $16 meal for $5 using local provider networks, local supply chains, and procurement. And we have national delivery because, as mentioned earlier, we need to get a lot of these pilots bigger and national in scale. And we are prepared to do that. And she's probably going to murder me because I might have jumped the gun on the announcement. We won't tell her. Okay. All right. Thank you all so much for sharing your expertise. Thank you, um, audience, and look forward to seeing how uh, you all continue to change the system. Appreciate it. Thanks to our panel for such a great conversation. We're going to take a, a quick 10-minute break. There is coffee. There are uh, some, some snacks out on the East Wing. We'll be back here at 3 o'clock. Thanks. Produced by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services.